Welcome everyone. This is the uh, 13th annual Powertrain Strategies for the 21st Century Conference, uh, Managing the Transition to EVs. Uh, last year, we started, we looked at the tipping points for EVs. And this year, uh, as we know, there's a tremendous amount of, of announcements throughout the world about EVs. And <clears throat> we thought this would be a good time to talk about how to manage the transition to EVs. There's a lot of discussion about this. There's a lot of different angles uh, to approach this. And we'll be looking at these today and tomorrow. So we have a two-day conference. Um, we all hope that everyone could, was able to uh, get the, the new link to the YouTube video uh, so you live stream so that you can see what the uh, uh, what, we're, what we're doing here. Um, my name is Bruce Belzowski. I'm the Automotive Futures Group Managing Director, uh, retired from the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute. Um, I'm going to go, go through some slides here to show you the, the work that we've been doing. A little bit about our Automotive Futures Group, the conference logistics, and some research that we've been doing on the, the cost of range and power in EVs. Uh, we're looking at a global comparison here. <clears throat> um, as I said, I'm the managing director of the Automotive Futures Group uh, here in Ann Arbor. Our funding comes from our affiliate program. We always like to thank uh, uh, throughout the program and you'll hear that uh, without their support, we could not put on our conferences. Um, research includes uh, globalization, powertrains, uh, intelligent transportation systems and five annual conferences. <clears throat> Here's a list of our affiliate members. Uh, we like, again, thank them for all their support. Uh, our research partners who are part of our research uh, teams whenever we go for interviews and surveys reach across IT organizations, OEMs, uh, NGOs, uh, government folks, uh, suppliers, as well as consultants. Our, our research projects for 2021 focus on the powertrain strategies for the 21st century project. Results we'll be talking about tomorrow uh, during our second day of the conference. Our, our China, uh, China New Energy Project, you'll see some results from that uh, uh, after, as part of this presentation. Um, new Mobility is part of our, our uh, conference, uh, uh, set of conferences. We usually do those in, in February. Um, we'll next, uh, tomorrow we'll also be seeing some of the results from our uh, uh, recent uh, uh, survey of, uh, on, of industry uh, experts on uh, Tesla, and we call it the Tesla effect on the uh, on the automotive industry. Um, and also, we're looking at our our researchers, Kara uh, uh, Elkire, who's online right now on the the uh, YouTube video. She'll be uh, gathering questions that you have in the chat. Uh, but there's also a link in the description uh, to the YouTube video that or allows you where you can. Uh, anonymously uh, uh, put in questions uh, and she'll re uh, send those over to me. Uh, these are our student researchers. We had across a variety of, of disciplines. Uh, also our, our, one of our, uh, probably our, we're doing this for about a year now, uh, our LinkedIn page, where we're posting about uh, two to three, sometimes four times a week, uh, information, one uh, snippets of of knowledge that we're learning uh, along the way that we really want to get out to our affiliates and to the people who are following us so that we don't have to wait until conferences to, to give out information. Uh, so this is one thing that, that we've been working on over the last year. Uh, please uh, join and follow us uh, on LinkedIn and you'll see what we're talking about in terms of the, uh, the snippets of knowledge that we'll be uh, sending out. Uh, usually, it's a lot of the stuff also has to do with the conference um, uh, and our affiliates program as well. Our upcoming conferences on September 1st, uh, we're having our 13th annual Future of Automotive IT conference. <clears throat> and here we're doing an autonomous vehicle update. And uh, November, our 14th annual Inside China conference, uh, looking at 
the uh, Chinese automotive industry from a variety of perspectives. These are our presenters for today. Uh, Hans Eric Mellon from uh, Circular Energy Storage is going to uh, lead us off uh, talking about uh, battery reuse and recycling. Uh, Kelsey Peterson from DTE is going to be talking about uh, some of the issues that electric companies and power companies are dealing with in preparation for the transition to EVs. Uh, Chris Harto from Consumer uh, Reports is going to talk about consumer research uh, on EVs, some of their recent research that, they, that they've put out. Uh, and one of the key elements of, of the transition to EVs of will consumers uh, buy in and be able and buy the vehicles uh, to keep, get, the, get the volumes up to make the transition uh, an easier one. And last uh, speaker today, uh, Kara Cockleman from uh, University of Texas at Austin. She'll be talking about some of the research that she's been doing. Uh, she's all over the, uh, all over the map on, on terms of understanding what's going on uh, in terms of transportation issues related to EVs. And she'll be talking about some of the tax, tax policy issues, uh, especially the fuel tax. <clears throat> and so we'll be doing that and uh, a journey around 1215 might have to stretch it a little out a little bit now because we started a little later. Uh, Post-conference, uh, the, all the attendees will link, uh, get a link to the presentations uh, that will be on our website. Uh, that'll be up by uh, the weekend. Uh, affiliates get the link to the presentations, but they also get a, a link uh, to a review of the highlights of the conference, uh, summary of the conference that we'll be uh, doing over the next week. Uh, the, the agenda, uh, we sent all of you the agenda through, the, through email. Uh, speaker bios, registration lists, sponsorship opportunities, affiliate information, upcoming events uh, all on our, our uh, website that, uh, and the link to that was in the email that we sent you yesterday. Uh, audience questions and feedback. As I said, the, uh, under, underneath the description of the YouTube video that we're uh, running right now, the, uh, there's a link to the question forms, uh, the Google forms for uh, if you want to submit a question uh, to the speakers. Also, there's a uh, you can put it into the chat, and Kara Elkire will will put it into the into the queue for me. Uh, also, there's a link to conference feedback, um, and if we appreciate any any feedback you can give us uh, about our conferences. Let's look at some of the the issues that we've been looking at. Uh, from our global EV uh, project, we've done some analysis on the cost of range and power in EVs. These are the authors, uh, some of our students, uh, myself and, and my colleague, uh, Sergio Munez from, uh, from Brazil. Uh, we've been working on following the Chinese automotive industry uh, since uh, 2015, 2016. Uh, where we started in say 2017, 2018, started following the global automotive, global EV industry. And this is some of the research that, that's come out of that. Uh, range, of course, is one of the big issues having to do with, uh, with EVs and it affects the willingness to purchase of an EV, of EV. Also, we've seen significant increases in EV range over the past three years. So uh, measuring the range improvement as a function of the cost of the vehicle and as a function of the power of the battery is what we're looking at in, in this particular project. Uh, the two, two functions are related, range and power, uh, but they may differ because of each uh, company's battery management system. Not every electric vehicle uh, uses its power uh, and, and to get the, the same amount of range. So this is something that, that we're kind of testing with our, with our research. So we're basically we're doing a range ratio where we're measuring the price of a, a per kilometer and, uh, and for, the, uh, for the range and for the battery ratio or price uh, per kilowatt hour of battery capacity. Um, again, the price is always the uh, MSRP for the vehicle. Uh, so we're comparing these two indicators across vehicles sold in the US, Europe, and China in 2018, 2019, and 2020. So we have basically two sets of data. 
We have model data that looks at all the models, the EV models that are available uh, throughout the world and particularly China, US and, and Europe. And we have specifications data uh, having to do with pricing. And here we're looking at, as I said, MSRP only. We're in the, in the incentive, incentives that are available in each country are not, are not included in the pricing. Um, we have the range <clears throat> that's reported uh, by, by the manufacturers. We haven't done any testing. The folks who are doing the specifications, uh, we're always we're using uh, uh, third party uh, information here. Uh, uh, and so secondary sources for the, for the data, uh, power, battery power, and also a vehicle segment. So we actually did some segment analysis. Uh, there's a lot of data that's missing. So we only used uh, vehicles where we had complete data. We use medians rather than means uh, for summarizing pricing and range, uh, in particular because of uh, the luxury vehicles that can be placed across all the different uh, segments, which makes it uh, more difficult uh, to get a, a good mean. So we use medians. Um, pricing is in dollars, range is in kilometers. Uh, as I said, incentives are not included in the pricing. These are some of our data sources. This data, this, this uh, uh, information will be up on the website as well if you wanna take a look at, at our sources for, for Europe, US, and China. <clears throat> so when you look at some of the model data, uh, for example, in the, the chart on the left-hand side uh, with the 2018 to 2020, you can see China uh, is really taking the lead and in terms of the number of vehicles. Uh, and we've looked at, uh, here you can see the mini compact, subcompact, compact, midsize, and full-size vehicles. Fine. And then you see the, the Europeans uh, 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 moving up, especially in the 2020s, and, and the U.S. falling behind. Uh, in the segmentation uh, uh, story on the right-hand side, these are the numbers of vehicles that are actually involved in our analysis uh, for this particular analysis. As I said, we only use data where we had complete data, so we were not estimating in anything, any, uh, making any estimates. Uh, but as you can see, um, there's a steady increase year on year across all three regions in the number of EVs. Models are concentrated in the compact, subcompact segments. And there's a real lack of models in the full size segments across all, all regions. So as I said, the analysis questions is how, uh, are, are how much is a consumer paying for every uh, kilometer of in, uh, increase and how much is a consumer paying for every kilowatt hour increase? And how do these ratios vary by region, segments, and within regions and over time? So let's look, take a look at the range ratio. Uh, here we're looking at the uh, median range ratio for uh, for range uh, from uh, US from uh, 2018 to 2020, Europe and, and China. Uh, as you can see, year over year decreases uh, it, across regions, uh, except for China 2020, but there was a huge decrease in uh, uh, actually in the range rate in, in dollar per uh, kilometer for uh, China in 2019 from 2018. Um, the story basically is that Chinese right now are paying the least for a kilometer of range. Uh, when we look across uh, uh, segments, we really had to do some combining here. Uh, the low numbers uh, in vehicles across the segments in our analysis so far uh, creates lots of anomalies in, in, in how the, what, what any trends we might see. So we're always uh, we're we're saying that to take these uh, with a grain of salt because of the uh, uh, the the lower numbers of vehicles that are available. Some patterns are there's some patterns for paying more for range as size of vehicle increases. There's also patterns of paying less for range over time. Uh, and luxury vehicles, as as we know, in all these segments can ha have a, an effect, especially when you have smaller numbers of vehicles. So. As we continue our analysis over time, adding more vehicles, we expect the, the segment analysis to be a little stronger. Looking at the uh, median battery uh, ratio, how much are consumers paying per kilowatt hour 
Uh, you see year over year decreases across all regions. Um, and in general, uh, consumers are paying less uh, for the power of the batteries uh, in, in China compared to the uh, EU and, and the US. Again, low numbers in the, when looking across segments, low numbers, lots of anomalies, some patterns are paying more for power as the size of the vehicle increases. Some patterns are paying less for power over time. Again, the luxury segment also has an issue here. So we'll be looking at this as, as we can continue. Uh, so over the span of three years, more manufacturers are entering and they're providing more BEV models to consumers uh, with China leading the way in terms of numbers of models. Uh, over the three years, consumers paid less for range and battery power for newer models. Uh, most BEVs in the mini and subcompact compact segments <clears throat> with many fewer BEVs in the midsize and, and full size segments. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to segments and mostly due to the smaller numbers of vehicles. Um, as I say before, there's a pattern of paying more for range and power as the size of the vehicle increases and paying less for range and power over time. Uh, in terms of meeting the $100 per kilowatt hour, no region is really close to meeting that goal yet, uh, though China is the closest. So when you look at our future work, we're gonna try to look at maybe sales weighting some of the data uh, for certain vehicles. Uh, we're also looking at continuing to fill in the gaps of the data that where we have uh, gaps in the data, continuing to add new vehicles. There's new vehicles adding, uh, coming in online all the time. And we're also may look at analyzing other vehicle characteristics, having to do with some power, maybe power, other, other uh, measurements of power uh, that we may be looking at. So uh, that's all I wanted to talk about uh, as part of my intro. Uh, and I'm going to stop my share here. And we're going to move over to uh, uh, Hans Eric, who's our, our first speaker, uh, who's going to be talking about uh, recycling and the uh, reuse of batteries. <clears throat> As I said, there's a lot of issues having to do with uh, the transition to EVs, and we're starting kind of like the at the tail end of the of the whole process here with the reuse and recycling. But when you talk about recycling, and if you talk about materials and the need for new materials, uh, the recycling story, as Hans Eric is going to be talking about really could have a, a dramatic effect on how much you're actually going to have to mine new volumes of lithium uh, in the future. Uh, so uh, Hans Eric, uh, uh, take it away. So thank you so much for, for inviting me. Uh, it's, a, it's a big honor, uh, would love to be there. Um, well, I'm, in a way I have no one is there, so everybody in the same situation. Um, but, um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm based in London. Um, I'm uh, running a company called Circle Energy Storage. We are a consultancy company that covers the, uh, the, the life cycle of, of lithium ion batteries. Uh, not only EV batteries, but obviously lithium ion uh, or EV batteries is um, what's really driving the market uh, today. And what I'm going to talk about today is obviously uh, reuse and recycling of of EV batteries. Uh, Bruce gave me a great segue here, I think, because um, I, I sometimes think we, we have talked too much about recycling. Yeah. It's uh, because the recycling is um, obviously something that is happening right now. It, it happened 10 years ago as well. Uh, but if we look at the, the large volumes, really, this is something for the future. Nevertheless, it's really important. Uh, and I totally agree that uh, what we are doing now also have consequences for how we are doing this in 10 years from now. Uh, and there are also a lot of opportunities uh, down the road here um, for anyone involved in the value chain, not only for, for recyclers or reuse companies, but the implications can be actually quite huge also for OEMs, for battery manufacturers. And everybody really has to be involved in this area uh, already today. Um, so a little bit about our company. Uh, we are a small consultancy, in a, as I said, based in London. We provide data on the, the lithium ion batteries from the point when they are placed on the market. Um, and we collect and do a lot of research on 
how the batteries in fact are used, how they are traded, uh, and ultimately how they will be reused and recycled. Um, we do understand a fair amount of what is happening uh, uh, upstream as well, uh, not least because that's the, the most important part for, for the recycling industry, of course. Uh, if the material will go back into the industry, we also have to understand everything from mining uh, and refining of materials. But our expertise is really on uh, fr from the point uh, when we place the battery on the market. Um, we, um, we sell subscriptions of this data uh, and we also do consultancy around this, obviously, we, 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 with the data as a, as a foundation for this. Often quoted international media and also uh, involved with uh, in research, both here in the UK and uh, also in the US, which we are really happy for. Uh, a little bit our, about the data I'm going to talk about. Um, so we, we have a combined bottom-up and top-down approach, uh, we, we, which means that we, we really look at the, the problem from, from both ends in a sense. So this core in our data is really about the, the volumes of batteries that are placed on the market. And that data is derived from uh, as you can see uh, here from uh, all kinds of battery data uh, that is involved in, in different kinds of applications. Uh, and then we look at how much of these applications that are placed on the market around the world. So in particular, we cover the US, Europe and China, uh, increasingly also markets like South, uh, South Korea, Japan and India, where, where we see a lot coming up really in this area. And what we derive, uh, what, what this drives to is uh, that, that we get the volume from um, uh, what is placed on the market. We, we, uh, we we've, as I said, put a lot of emphasis on understanding how, how the batteries are used. So from there, we model uh, how, when the, the, the various uh, applications and the battery will reach end of life. And then we uh, look bottom up, really look what is actually happening in the market. So we follow um, more than 150 companies that are involved today or will be involved in lithium ion battery recycling, uh, over 200 companies that are involved in some way in reuse of uh, the batteries and the entire ecosystem really to, to come up with these numbers. Um, and I'm gonna start here. Uh, obviously uh, this is the, the most important part and also what, uh, what set recycling apart from, for instance, mining. Um, because the volumes obviously are depending on what is placed on the market in the very beginning. And I, um, it's quite astonishing how often I have to remind people that you, you can't recycle more than what there is to recycle, um, which is uh, to some extent a difference to, to, uh, to, to mining. Well, you can't mine more when, when there is to mine, but you can dig deeper at least. Uh, there is a limit for recycling. Uh, so let's start here. Uh, to the left, you see uh, a chart showing the um, all kinds of lithium ion batteries in the various applications that have been placed on the global market since 2010 uh, or, or for every year since 2010. And what you can see here is how the, this market was predominantly a market for portable batteries until 2014-15 when we uh, we saw the first electric vehicles and not least electric buses predominantly in China being placed on the market. And from then, it, it's really the, the growth has really been um, about the, the, the vehicles, but also other applications which have been enabled by, um, by the scale and the volumes uh, that we have been producing batteries now for, for vehicles. That has also been enabling the applications like using lithium ion batteries in UPS and energy storage. Uh, in, the, in other industrial segments as well. If you look to on the, uh, the bar to the right in the left chart in 2020, that is the same bar as the, the left bar in the, in, in the chart to the, uh, to the right. Uh, and that shows you really what, what do we have in front of us. And what's interesting with these two numbers uh, is that the, the growth rate as we expect it's not that different. We, we have a phenomenal growth rate behind us, but we have basically the same growth rate in front of us. But what is the main difference here is really that everything will really be driven by the electric vehicles, um, both light electric vehicles and, and heavy electric vehicles. 
but also as you can see segments like personal mobility which is like anything from from e-bikes to, to two and three uh, three and even four wheelers but uh, low speed vehicles uh, and you also see how other applications uh, like maritime uh, ups uh, and industrial batteries will take off um, as well so um, fantastic development obviously that we have in, in, in front of us um, what's important is obviously to, to look at how this is distributed all over the world and there you can see this is uh, a lot really about China uh, that has been leading this uh, in basically all aspects. Um, there the most of the batteries are produced, most of the battery materials are produced in China and um, most batteries are consumed in, in, in China as well. Not only electric vehicles, both on the light and heavy side, but also for personal mobility and portable batteries. Uh, that's really the, the, the epicenter of uh, the, the lithium ion battery de uh, development. Um, electric vehicles um, in that market, the US, Europe, and China, in the early 2010, 11, 12, all these three markets basically were on par. But since then, uh, China has been accelerating so much faster. And today we see the fastest acceleration really in, in the trajectory of in the growth trajectory is really in Europe. Um, based on the um, on the incentives and um, that really pushed the industry to uh, to put out electric vehicles on the market, uh, and we also see um, not least in the so-called rest of the world, which is has has predominantly been South Korea, Japan, Australia, but uh, increasingly also India and Southeast Asia, where we see a lot of personal mobility coming online. Now. Now you should remember the colors of uh, in, in these parts and the actual structure of the market because now we're going to look at what is available for recycling in the world. And that is completely different to what is placed on the market right now. So to the left, the blue line here is the how much batteries that we are placing on the market in tons um, uh, on, the on, on the global market. And then in the green line is what is reaching end of life. And end of life for us, the, how we define it is when the battery will be removed from its first application. So it doesn't mean it has to be recycled, but it will not serve as it's for, uh, in, in, in that application as when, where it was included the first time it, it was used. Uh, and what we can see here, it's really, uh, yeah, sorry, the, the yellow line is what is available for them for recycling. And what we see is that the ratio between what is placed on the market and what uh, is becoming uh, available for, for recyclers uh, will be smaller or less. I mean, it will be less compared to what is placed on the market. And that could be because the, the, the market is growing much faster, but uh, as we just saw, uh, it is not growing faster. It has been growing all the time. The main reason is that we place the batteries now in applications which last much longer. And so uh, we, we, we used to place the, the batteries in portable batteries, which last like three to, to seven, eight years. Now we place it in cars, which last 10 to, to 20 years, and the batteries um, uh, go with them, uh, essentially. Uh, so if you look on the top right, uh, you see that this will, for a long time, be mostly about portable batteries. Um, it will be about uh, personal mobility and, and the other segments, and then in the end of uh, like 29, 2030, then we will see more of an impact of, of, of the vehicles. You also see that this is very much a China play. Uh, and you also see how the, the rest of the world in terms of what is available for recycling will, will catch up. And in the end as well, you, you will see some in Europe, but uh, the US is not really going in that, um, having the same pace. Uh, here is for the US. Uh, here you can actually see that the, the ratio looks a little bit different. Uh, it's actually more batteries available for recycling in the US compared to what is placed on the market. But that is mainly because there are that not much batteries placed on the market compared to other regions in the world right now. And uh, because of uh, it's not really the same pace in the electric vehicle markets like in Europe and China. Uh, so you can also see up in the top right, when we talk about pure recycling, it will be very much about uh, portable batteries. And you can also see in the chemistries that the chemistries uh, will be very diverse. We, we have a lot of LFP batteries and you could 
think that that is because we, we now have Tesla going over to, to LSP in, in, in the base models or so Volkswagen do the same. But mainly this is really from, from forklifts, from buses, from uh, power tools where we have a lot of LFP batteries, which actually is one of the, the main segments in, in portable batteries. Uh, so not so much uh, from cars at all, in fact. Why is this? Well, that is um, mainly because uh, electric vehicle batteries have very long lives. Uh, they are good. Uh, they have been good all the time, almost at least. Uh, there have been some, uh, in some cases, we have had uh, a few batteries that didn't fare that very well, especially in the US, in fact. But uh, since then, since 2014, uh, batteries, batteries is basically always over-delivered, really, in, in, in terms of what people did expect from them. To the left here, you see a chart of the prices of Nissan Leaf base model in the US. Uh, and there you can see that if you want to buy a Nissan Leaf from 2011, you still have to pay around $5,000. And that might not be a lot of money for an EV uh, or and not even for a 10-year-old compact, but um, it's still $5,000. Uh, so you, you, if, you, if you pay that, you obviously don't, will, you will not just send that to the scrapyard anytime soon. So you'll actually use it. And this is how, I mean, how it always worked, obviously, with cars, that we, we, we have a, a great market for, for cars where uh, the, the different needs we have, um, I mean, we, we, we transfer the car uh, between the various needs. So the, the, the car can be a second car, it can be for somebody that only needs it, uh, needs it for, for uh, local, uh, um, yeah, doing local stuff uh, around the house. Um, and uh, I mean, most people don't drive that much, um, which we actually can see in the chart in the, in, in the middle. And there you can also see that the, the older the car gets, the less we are driving, which means that we have less and less degradation of the battery. Um, so what we have seen is that um, very few batteries reach end of life when they are in the vehicle. Uh, there are a few cases with like uh, extreme cases with Tesla, uh, Nissan Leaf, um, um, that has been used in, in like in Uber or taxis uh, where they have been replacing the battery, but that is quite rare. Um, most people will, uh, or most cars will, will have the same battery throughout its life. Um, and then it's actually the, the life of the car that is important to, uh, to determine how, for how long will, the, it, will, it, will it take until the battery will become available for, for end, some kind of end of life treatment. And as you can see, uh, there is really no hockey stick or like a sudden tsunami of, of, of batteries uh, entering the, the market because uh, if you look at the Toyota Prius, uh, which is not an electric vehicle, but it's still it's, it's a car with a battery, um, it, there are not more Toyota Prius from 2001 that reach end of life this year than from 2019. Um, so it's really about the, uh, the car remains on the road until it is not economical to, to repair it or to, or, or to keep it. And that can be very, very long. We, we have data for 30 years old cards um, and th they remain on the road for a very long time. They just shift owners. Um, another thing is that, uh, and this is increasing, that we have a lot of cars being exported. And this is a situation we have in Europe, but there's also this uh, situation in particular in the US with these, um, the with new platforms, digital platforms, uh, end of life vehicles, or I would say vehicles that used to be end of life vehicles are now available for anyone in the world to, to bid on and to, uh, and, and to, to export from, uh, from the, the US. And to the left here, you can see Nissan Leaf being available on, on, on used uh, car sites uh, where you can see the early models of Nissan Leaf uh, there you see a lot of them in Ukraine, in Russia, uh, and not so much in the in, in the countries where they actually was, uh, where, where they were sold from the very beginning, the US, UK, Germany, and Norway, uh, while it's the other way around for the later models. So both used and end-of-life vehicles are living in the country. In the middle here, you see here in the UK um, that more and more Nissan Leaf are leaving. In fact, the early models of Nissan Leaf, more than 30% have left the country already. Um, and there are a lot of incentives in many countries. I mean, they also want to be electrified. Uh, so uh, there is often no VAT, no tariffs on, uh, on used electric vehicles. 
Uh, so you have a lot of markets that are buying a lot of used vehicles. And obviously batteries are included. Um, this is just examples of uh, how cars have some, many times actually would have reached end of life in the US, been uh, dismantled and uh, be sold for spare parts. Now will be put back on the road, but in, in, in other markets uh, in, instead. And honestly, I, 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 I think we haven't seen the end of this because um, there are so many factors like from the digital platforms that we haven't had available like 10 years from now or 10, uh, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, also, uh, electric vehicles means that you are exporting uh, zero emission when we always been accused of uh, exporting pollution. But that, that's not the, the case. So it's so very attractive vehicles to, uh, to export to other countries. And obviously that affects the, the availability of batteries to recycle. Another thing is that batteries are used. Um, and to the left, you see how much EV batteries that are used in uh, stationary energy storage in, in Europe. And, and this is something that's predominantly been done in Europe much more than in the US. But what is also important here that half of these batteries are new batteries. And they are it, it's new EV batteries that are basically conditioned to be used in the future as spare parts in these vehicles. Um, but there are also second life um, uh, batteries. But also another important aspect of the stationary energy storage is that there are very few energy storage systems uh, that are created with energy, uh, EV batteries that do not have a direct involvement of the OEM. So usually these are not really end of life batteries in the case for BMW and for Renault, for instance, it's been upgrades when, they, when, when they're offering up upgrades to the customers going from 22 kilowatt hour to 33 kilowatt hour, for instance. Um, and then by, by doing that, they obviously get hold of a, uh, of a large amount of batteries and, and, and can, um, can do this in an efficient and, uh, and organized, organized way. In the middle, you see um, how, uh, the, the growth of, of batteries, uh, or sorry, growth of companies um, in terms of number of companies. Some of them are very small and don't have too much activities, but you can see uh, how it's actually growing in terms of companies that are involved and not only involved, but in many cases are basing their entire business on some kind of second life activities. And one of the most uh, important uh, segment here is not energy storage, it's EV conversion. So especially batteries from Nissan and from Tesla are used in, uh, to, to take old Porsches or uh, um, yeah, any kind of car uh, that you love, uh, but now would like to see electrified. Um, and uh, both the motors and the batteries are used in these cases. And you can to the right see how the prices of used batteries are very high, most often much higher than what what new batteries are. Um, and the reason for that is that even if Tesla and General Motors and Ford can buy batteries maybe for $100 a kilowatt hour, uh, do it to selfers can't, the startups can't, uh, many store energy storage companies can't do that either. So their benchmark prices are much higher. Oh, so of that reason, you can actually sell these batteries to, to much higher price. And I, I don't see why that would, uh, would uh, not happen in the future. It just follow the, 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 the same trajectory really. Uh, so this is important when it comes to understanding reuse because then there is a narrative saying that, oh, we don't, we don't want second life batteries in our energy storage systems. Uh, says energy companies or, uh, or energy storage specialists. And that might be so, absolutely. But, but that is basically the same thing to say, uh, go into a, like a Louis Vuitton store and saying that, no, I saw these bags that were too expensive. I know there are cheaper ones, we, we don't need them. So I don't think there is a market for these bags. Um, I mean, you have to look at it from, from a much wider perspective because there are always another market that might not be, have the same kind of needs that you have. And I think that is what has been coloring this narrative because there is always a lot of, uh, 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 when you have volume of the batteries, there is a lot of demand for, for most of these batteries, which keep the prices very high and makes it hard for recyclers to, to actually source these batteries. And uh, many of them actually don't really, they don't even see them because they, they they are uh, disappearing already from the car dismantlers, from the e-waste companies, and never come to the actual battery collectors. 
Uh, EV conversion uh, is a big market, but everything where you can re replace that asset, both professionally and for, um, for do-it-yourself, uh, are big market for reuse. And another interesting aspect when we talk about reuse is, oh, but who wants to use these 10-year-old batteries? And um, uh, it, I mean, uh, so much has happened. The energy density is better right now. So people would like to have new batteries. Of course, people would like to have new batteries if they can, if they if they can afford them, uh, they, they would rather use new batteries in most cases. In some cases, they won't, in fact, because um, they actually, many times, people rely more on used batteries because they know what they get. But when they buy it on Alibaba, they don't know what they get. Actually, often they get used batteries, although they thought they were new. But this is interesting, um, um, as I see, because if to the left here, you see which year models could we expect to reach end of life uh, in, in, in different years? So in 2030, you could see that the, the, dominant, uh, the dominant years that will we reach end of life in 2030 are cars between 2011 and 2019. They have the green and the, 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 the yellow and orange there. But if you look at this from a volume perspective, we, we, we do a volume <laughs> adjustment. This is not the case at all, obviously, of the reason that we did not sell that many electric vehicles in 2010, 2011. We, we will sell much more in 2030 and in the late 20s. So of that reason, uh, only the cars that will come from crashes, from warranty uh, replacements, will be much, much bigger than what we had from, from, the, very, uh, from, from the really some kind of real end of life. So of, of that reason, the the end of life batteries will always be fairly, fairly new and obviously very attractive in these markets. So my message, I won't, won't go through this, don't worry, but you will have it in the pack, but this is my message about what, how the, the end of life market really looks like. It's, uh, it's a big ecosystem and which looks very different depending on where you are in this uh, in the system. So uh, many of these as we start to be, become more and more professionalized, like the secondhand battery retailers, something that obviously was, did not exist five years ago, but we, um, I think we are listing 30, 40 um, uh, companies around the world that uh, do a fair amount of, of trading of, uh, of used electric vehicle and other kind of lithium ion batteries. Um, so it's a, it's a much more complex system. So this narrative again, that a battery will remain in a car until it's like 80% of its capacity and then it will magically be removed and turn into an energy storage device in five to 10 years and then will reach recycling. That's not the case. It's much more complex than that. Then for recyclers, um, it's not even the end of life batteries that are most important uh, because in the next years, uh, if you look at the actual volumes, it will be re much more batteries will come from production scrap uh, from when we are producing cells and packs and, um, uh, and capital materials. Um, a lot will obviously come from, from test and R&D vehicles. And of course, it, the smaller, the, 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 the larger, or the, the, the total volumes that we are placing on the market, the larger uh, in, in comparison, um, the, the R&D vehicles will be. And also unsold uh, volumes of batteries that did not make the final cut because there was a new battery coming online. There we have a lot of applications as, uh, or battery volume as well. Uh, it should be said that the, the, the two uh, categories to the right here, many of those batteries will actually go into reuse. Uh, not least when the OEMs becomes more and more interested in, in to find out whether they would have integrated models with uh, using second life batteries in their own programs, like for EV charging and, and things like that, there we have more and more batteries, in fact, going into that direction as well. But a lot of these will go to recycling. So if we look at the, the, the capacity um, in the world for, for recycling, it's, um, it's quite, um, I would say quite good. Um, I mean, everything can give, be better when it comes to, to efficiency. We, we definitely have some uh, recycling um, processes that um, are, are, I mean could could be much much better, and the incremental improvements are are certainly welcome, and more than that. But there is capacity to 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 recycle batteries. There is uh, most of that is in China. A lot is in South Korea. 
Um, but now if we look at the pace that we place uh, capacity on the, the US market, on the European market, it's, it's an extreme pace. Given that all the announcements actually will materialize, because I'm not really sure it, they will, because this will be a fairly tough market. And as you can see to the right here, I mean, the, if you look at the volume, th this will really be about production scrap. Um, and um, I, I'm not suggesting here that we, we suddenly we, we end up with having no capacity in 2028. It's just that we, 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 we are run out of announcements uh, at that time. So I, I'm fairly sure that uh, that will be fixed um, by, by then. So we have an overcapacity on a global basis. Uh, if you look at the US, we go from very small volumes, but now we only did the last year, we have several companies that, that um, uh, coming or, or having put a lot of capacity on, online and we will have more, more of that as well. Um, so I'm not really worried that we, we won't be able to take care of the batteries. Uh, I, I actually can't see that happening really because there is so much value in it is such a delay. And the bigger problem might be really for, for, for individual recyclers, how they're actually gonna source the uh, source material for their operations. Uh, but what I also think is important from a recycler's point of view is that you're not there to take care of the, the, the batteries that suddenly end up as waste. You're a raw material company, you're a battery material company, and you have to source material for your production anywhere in the world. And I think that is really what's uh, an important approach for, for the recyclers. They must look at themselves as material companies and not just sit and wait of what might end up in the warehouses as battery collectors. There is value in lithium ion batteries. Uh, there's a lot of talk about that the values in lead acid batteries are much higher. That's not true. As you can see in, here in the, in the middle, uh, even LF3 batteries are worth more than lead acid batteries, given that you actually recover what's in the batteries. And that has not always been the case. LF3, for instance, has mostly been recovered for the copper, but today it's mainly driven by lithium. And if, as we get, if we get into graphite, as well, I mean, that then you add a, a third uh, of the value to LFP, and which will make it even more uh, valuable, obviously. So it's really about volume. I, I brought in the, the, the chart here from Sweden to the right, where you have comparing and, and to give an understanding of why, why is it much more lead acid batteries that are recycled than lithium ion. And that is because we don't collect a lot of lithium ion batteries because they have long lives, haven't been there for, long, for quite that time as lead acid. The lead acid battery is 150 years. It's been in our cost for 100, 100 years. Uh, the lithium ion batteries have only been in cost for, for 10 years and in a very few of them. Uh, so volume is what is required. That, that, that's the key to everything here. That's the key for to have uh, the economies of scale and a recycling process. That's the key to, to have a, a, a product that you actually can sell. And there are... Um, you can basically re recover almost anything um, in a lithium ion battery. There are various methods to do that. Uh, some might be better uh, than others, but uh, I trust also that we are in the beginning here. We, we have a lot of improvements to do in, in all these aspects. I personally don't see this as a, techno as a technology play. Uh, it's much more about logistics, about uh, being located in the right spot, uh, having the right permits, uh, to, to produce the correct materials and to be integrated with the right players. Uh, what we see in China and South Korea, which is really leading the game, is a vertical integration going backwards. So, so it's really about the capital producers that, uh, uh, that are using recycled materials to feed their production much more than it's just the recycler that the recycler was end up uh, uh, in, in their plant. Uh, and I think that's important that, is, that that's really the key for, for this to work, uh, that kind of vertical integration, because in each segment, the margins are not very high. Um, so that's a very important aspect. Um, I won't go through this, it will be but just to showing that there is certainly challenges throughout the value chain in everything from the disintegration of the battery pack to make that effective, like the disintegration of the battery cells, which can be done in different ways, 
the actual material separation and the recovery. Uh, there are challenges everywhere, but there are also solutions everywhere. And there is really nothing here that can't be done today or that is not done. Again, it's a matter of volume, uh, which really uh, is it's a big, big importance. And also to have an end buyer. One of the biggest problem in the US is that there, is, there are no capital producers. And if there is no capital producers, who's gonna buy the nickel and cobalt sulfate and the lithium carbonate that actually goes into a, a, in a battery in a capital? It will be exported anyway. So if you want recycling to happen in a really large scale, it's really important to have the, the ones that actually need the material. In Europe, that is starts now to happening, uh, both from European players and also from Korean players. And I think we will see the same thing in the US. Uh, just a um, uh, few words about the EU battery regulation that will change a lot, uh, most probably globally, uh, not least because we will require uh, recycled content. Uh, I'm personally not uh, so much ha so happy over that because I think we will produce more batteries than what we will, uh, what we will uh, actually end up recycled material. So we, we won't be able to reach those, uh, those limits. And I also think from a, from a European perspective, I think there are players around the world that are much better positioned to actually uh, solve these problems than what the European companies are. Uh, so so I I'm, I'm, I'm not, do not really believe that this is a great way to, to strengthen the, the battery system as such. But it will, from an environmental standpoint, uh, it's definitely very positive. And uh, from, a, from, from a global perspective, it's great as well. And will definitely have an impact all over the world. I will finish with this. Uh, I, I think what's important here is to look at this as something that is still changing. And I think uh, a business concept like battery as a service, which we see more and more in China and in particular in South Korea, where it's uh, integrated uh, from the battery material producers throughout to the, the, the vehicle producers. Uh, it can be anything from battery swapping to leasing our batteries, uh, anything that where you retain control of the battery, which obviously is the most valuable component in the car. Uh, I think those are very important and might change this because it means that you will remove the battery not when the old one is bad, because, uh, but because there is a new one that might be better. Uh, either that it's in short term, like in swapping or in long term, like for leasing also vehicle to grid. I mean, we, we have a lot of batteries. I mean, the biggest problem with the batteries is that we are not using them. We are, the, the vehicles are standing in the driveway all the time and, and will die maybe 20 years old and we haven't really used the batteries. So I think services like vehicle to grid, integrated, maybe second life and uh, other aspects of the value chain will be very important to drive the value. And I think there is a, so much room for, uh, for innovation here. So yeah, I hope I was on time, I don't know, but uh, thanks a lot. Uh, that's, um, yeah, open questions. All right, thank you very much, Hans Eric. <clears throat> Let's stop sharing your screen there, very good. Uh, <coughs> um, you, you, you set up a, a, a nice lead in into Kelsey Peterson's uh, presentation next. Uh, when she's going to be talking about that vehicle to uh, vehicle to grid story, uh, so but uh, to start off with uh, questions for you, we got some good questions from from the audience. Um, one is, uh, uh, are there any end of life quality testing cost and needs? Uh, is there liability and potential that batteries are improperly disposed of by uh, DIYers if they don't end up with recyclers? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and I think not least from in a US perspective, but also from a European one, um, I think the this do it yourself market, uh, not least, I mean, we have had that market for many years. I mean, it didn't start with electric vehicle batteries. It started in particular with our 8650 cells from from, from laptops and we, we have so many innovative, some, some kind of crazy, but um, yeah, I, I look at it as an innovative projects uh, uh, around the US. Uh, but for sure, uh, this is not addressed at all. Uh, if you look at it, I mean, lithium ion batteries are, 
basically uh, classified as universal waste, which means that you you, you have some some uh, some liberty really when it comes to to how you treat that as a private person uh, to, to actually quite big volumes, and uh, that might be a problem. Although I think that. People that are involved in this also actually know what uh, what it's all about, and um, so so. But I think this should be addressed and acknowledged to a higher extent what what it is today, um, because otherwise it certainly can be a problem. And we we all already have problems. So uh, I mean that is not really about electric vehicle batteries when we have lithium batteries uh, generating fires in uh, in Merck's or in. Uh, yeah, material recovery facilities that is usually from portable batteries, but um, that might, of course, increase if we don't really look at it, how these are used in, in, in these kind of segments. Uh, there are also, of course, I mean, uh, accidents uh, uh, have all already happened. Uh, houses have been burned down to the ground. Uh, so, so certainly there are things that legislators could, could look into. Uh, another question having to do with uh, <clears throat> uh, recycling fees. Do you think uh, vehicle owners are re will be required to pay for the battery recycling fees when they scrap uh, their EVs? I mean, What's important is that, I mean, everybody that are running a company or professional services, whatever, I mean, obviously you would like to charge as much as possible. If I can charge in both ends, uh, which some recycling companies sometimes can, uh, I'm obviously very happy for all that. So I can charge when I, when I take your material and I can make money when I sell it. And, uh, and I'm not saying that is wrong at all because you're providing a service. Um, that, that most of us uh, would not be able to obviously do ourselves. Um, so I think anyone will obviously try to charge as much as possible. It's all about competition. If there is one car dismantler in the town, then it might be expensive. If there are two, it will be a bit cheaper. The same for recycling, of course. Um, obviously, the uh, I mean, today, most of the... Uh, in the US, 80% of the batteries that have been placed on the market are from Tesla. Uh, they usually have very high values, especially for Model S and X. Uh, so that is not really a, a problem. I, I don't think any car dismantler would be able to charge anyone for it because they know that they will sell it for um, I mean, every module for, for around seven to, to $800. So uh, of, of that reason, it's really about competition. and. Uh, I, I think sometimes we, we, we talk about cost in recycling as it was some kind of natural law, some uh, that it does cost. Uh, I mean, somebody's cost is usually somebody else's revenue and how that is um, distributed, uh, it all comes down to competition. So more recyclers in the market will obviously have a positive effect on the prices. Um, of course, uh, higher material prices. I mean, obviously last year or, or this year with, with the, the rally in nickel and cobalt has been extraordinary. Also lithium have come up from, from low volumes. So sure, I mean, th that will be um, very positive. But uh, my message is really that um, don't call once, <laughs> call, call to more, more companies. Okay, got another question for you. Is there any possibility for the U.S. government to introduce battery material recycling content targets as the EU is considering to do? To, to, to me, that is something that happens naturally. Uh, and again, I, I, I think it's too early um, to, to introduce those kind of requirements when the volumes are so low. I think an effect we, we, we are getting at in, in Europe, for instance, we, in the new regulation, we, we have individual recovery rates of, of nickel, nickel, lithium, and cobalt. Um, and and that the, the, they are set on how, how much recycled content uh, that would be in, uh, in the batteries, that's one thing, but also on the actual recovery rates. I think 
if you look at the pure recovery rates, that if, if you do recycle lithium ion batteries, you should be able to recover this much lithium, this much uh, nickel and cobalt. I think that is positive because that, that is, even if it can hurt for, for some recyclers, if they use technology that does not enable them to do that today, that at least it drives them forward. And if that also can be combined with uh, some clever financing, uh, it, it's even better because it, 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 it gives recyclers in the US uh, a better position because they can do something that, other, that they already can in Asia. So it, it actually it's better. When it comes to recycled content uh, that you're actually demanding uh, or mandating a, a, a recycled content in the batteries that are placed on the market, which is a proposal in Europe, that, that might have very strange effects. We, we don't even know how much lithium there will be in the batteries in 2030. So to have a percentage of how much lithium that should be recycled is a bit strange to, to, to me. Um, we don't even know whether there will be any cobalt at all um, in the battery. So um, uh, I think you should have targets that really make your own industry competitive uh, and, and better. That's, the, that, that's my view of it. And, but uh, that said, I, I think I, I'm very happy for, I mean, like in China, where they actually have those kind of uh, recovery rates, uh, that is driving their industry forward. Uh, if they want to meet the government's requirements, they, it makes their industry better and it makes it more competitive on a global basis. So, yes, I think that's positive. And I think it's possible. Very good. Uh, last question for you. <clears throat> you talked about the uh, scrapping rates uh, changing over time. Uh, you, uh, the, the questioner says the absolute amount of production scrap will increase in the next years and its share of recyclable batteries will increase as battery life will increase and production capacity will increase. Uh, as, you, uh, as you were mentioning, uh, can you tell us how scrap rates will change over time? No, <laughs> okay. not at all. I, I, I hope they will de decrease. And I, I think there is so much incentive with the battery producers to, uh, to keep them to a minimum level, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have done a lot of research uh, we, and we, we do have data for some individual battery plants, uh, which we have been able to study. Um, and we ended up with, we, we use uh, basically an overall uh, scrap rate of 10% of, of, of the dry material from the calendaring process to, uh, to, the, to the cells. And, um, uh, and that is throughout the in, in various steps in that chain, in, in particular, in the calendaring process, but also in the mixing stage before that. Um, there are others uh, saying that, oh, it's, uh, I heard in a seminar yesterday, uh, the, the scrap rates are 20 to 40%. Uh, that might be 20 to 40% when you're just ramping up something. But if the battery industry, when they are going uh, from plants with producing three to 30 gigawatt hours to like 100 gigawatt hours, if they haven't learned anything at that point and still will uh, will have scrap rates uh, on, on that, I, I can't see really that happening. Um, uh, I might find be naive, but that is not what our data tells us. Is uh, and I mean that has been one has to be one of the top priorities really to, to keep that as a, at the minimum level, and uh, and also of course it, it's a com competition factor. Uh, so I think that the if you look in Europe, we, we, we talk about how many mega factories or giga factories that we are putting online right now, but almost half of them has, have never made a battery. Uh, we have a few of them on not more than PowerPoint presentations and 3D renderings. And on the one hand, you can say that, yeah, there might be a lot of scrap from, uh, from those um, companies because they are learning. And it's not that there is a lot of expertise in this area either, but it might also be the case that what we actually will see is an increase of the, 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 the companies that are already the giants here, like LG, SK, Samsung, and Panasonic. And again, I, um, there has to be a learning curve, which they are much higher upon than what others are. So, um, but, uh, no, but obviously I don't know how, how it will pan out. Very good. 
All right. Thank you very much, uh, Hans Eric. I appreciate your taking the time and please join us for, for Q and A's on the, <clears throat> through the rest of the day uh, as, as you're available. Um, I'll go to our next speaker, uh, Kelsey Peterson from, uh, from DTE. She's the manager of uh, electric marketing and business development. Uh, uh, welcome, Kelsey. Thank you. Let me just share my screen here. Okay. Okay. All good? All good. All right, let's get started. So this might be back to basics for a lot of the audience, but I do wanna start out with just the general baseline that we believe transportation electrification benefits many stakeholders. So there's total cost of ownership savings for drivers um, through fuel and maintenance if they have enough annual miles on their vehicle. And there's also affordability benefits for our DT electric customers because we'd be spreading our, fix, our system fixed costs over increased off-peak sales, which helps put downward pressure on rates. So that's a big part of why we're trying to get into this. Um, it reduces emissions and improves air quality. So even in Michigan with our current generation portfolio that does contain coal, uh, wells to wheel analysis by the Alternative Fuels Data Center shows that EVs still have 45 to 60% lower emissions annually. So this is only going to continue to improve as we continue to shift towards renewables and cleaner sources of generation. And then lastly, although there's a risk to the existing powertrain supply chain, there's also economic development opportunities that comes with the EV market as Hans Eric just went over um, with new OEMs coming into the market. Uh, and, and other opportunities that arise from that with autonomous testing and things like that. So um, we're excited about the opportunity and we think that as the fuel provider, we obviously as a utility have a really important role to play. And our goals in this market are, are to reduce the barriers to EV adoption, especially as it pertains to uh, awareness of EVs and their lifetime and economic, their lifetime economic and environmental benefits. And then also awareness of public charging infrastructure and uh, relieving the uh, perceived lack of fueling infrastructure, the what people call range anxiety, making sure that there's a good foundation out there for our drivers. Um, most importantly, though, we want to make sure that the EV load is efficiently integrated with the grid. So making sure that um, we're upgrading and modernizing our system to prepare for EVs in the future in a way that's um, affordable and reliable for our customers. And then also to help enable equitable access to EVs. And, and there's growing focus on this, especially at the utility level to, to help um, create that level playing field and equity. And uh, our stakeholders expect us to be piloting new technologies as Bruce mentioned, especially as it relates to vehicle to X, I'll say. So I think there's a, there's a lot to do besides going to the grid. So vehicle to building, uh, that sort of thing to make sure that we're managing charging in a way uh, and benefiting our system that it, uh, benefits of EVs accrue to all of our customers. So momentum for transportation electrification is growing all around the country. And we work with several um, national EV working groups to make sure that these lessons learned are applied to best and best practices are applied not only to our own programs, but also to the state's working groups. So in Michigan specifically for those on the call in this area, um, Governor Whitmer created the Council on Future Mobility and Electrification uh, in October of 2020. And now the working groups are tasked with delivering recommendations to the governor by this September for potential inclusion in the 2022 budget. So our goal is really to support the state's initiative to ensure Michigan continues to be an epicenter of future transportation solutions. So that's why we have an eye sort of on what's going on around the country and we work closely with our utility partners to make sure that we're implementing best practices for our area. And really uh, 2021 is poised to be a breakout year for EVs around the country. Um, especially in Michigan though, the last two months of available data, which were March and April, broke all sales records. So um, on a national level, according to Ward's automotive reports and car research, plug-in hybrid sales were up 140% year to date compared to last year. And then all electric, BEVs are up 120%. And you can see from this chart here that in DC electric territory, we went from an average of EVs sold 
per month to about 200 EVs over the last four years to now in the last two months of data, that's 740 and then 911. So a huge, you know, three to five times increase in average sales. So we are starting to see this, um, what people call the hockey stick adoption curve, where it, it does start to take off. It does appear that we are at that, uh, that um, acceleration of adoption now. So we are focused at DTE really on five key segments of transportation. So those are passenger vehicles, um, which represents over 95% of the potential load that could come from transportation electrification. So this is just a huge market for us. Um, but we're also very focused on fleets, school buses, mass transit, and airports. Um, and the rest of my presentation will really give you an overview of the pilots we have in these, um, these areas to support their adoption. So Charging Forward is DT's electric vehicle pilot, and it was originally approved by the Michigan Public Service Commission about two years ago in May of 2019, uh, with three primary components for 13 million. Since it was approved, about 1 million um, has been added to include additional components that are supported by our stakeholders, and I'll get into that in more detail uh, later in the presentation. Um, but the, the three primary components are customer education outreach. So that was is for about 1.8 million. And this is really to increase EV awareness and recruit potential charging station operators or what we call site hosts. Um, and as I mentioned, there's also a big focus in this area on how to enable equitable access to EVs and intentionally engage underserved communities. Um, the next component is our residential uh, rebates, which totals about 1.3 million. And this is for $500 rebates to customers who install a qualified level two charger and, en and enroll in a year round time of use rate. And that's to encourage the off peak charging that then benefits all of our customers. The largest component then is our charging infrastructure enablement. And this is for about 10 million. And this uses a rebated make ready model, which I'll show in a minute. Um, to support the deployment of 90 fast chargers, 1,000 public workplace and multi-unit dwelling level two chargers. And then it also has a fleet piloting element um, that covers certain categories of fleets. So for education outreach, we're primarily focused on raising awareness of EVs and their, like I said, their lifetime economic and environmental benefits. And we've achieved about 50 million customer impressions pro program to date through these seven primary channels, which include um, digital, email, media, and other types of uh, launch events, on-bill messaging, um, miscellaneous collateral, uh, ride and drives, and then also social media. Uh, I would encourage you, if you're interested, to check out our website, which includes a virtual EV showroom at dteenergy.com forward slash EV. For the public charging rebates, we utilize a rebated make ready model. And this means that DTE fully funds the service connection, which is all of the DTE owned equipment up to and including the meter. And then we offer a rebate for the middle portion, what we call the supply infrastructure. This is all the electrical equipment between the meter and the charger for which the customer usually hires an electrician. Um, and then we require site hosts to partner with us and then they actually fund, own and operate the chargers themselves. So the rebate amounts are $2,500 per port for level two chargers and then up to 55,000 for fast chargers, depending on the power output. And you can learn more about that from our website, dtenergy.com forward slash evbiz. Uh, we've completed three rounds of RFIs now to qualify eight different network providers or our vendors for the program. And the reason we qualify the network provi providers is that um, we really are interested in getting the data from the chargers. So this way we're minimizing the amount of um, streamlining and integration we need to do to collect the data. Um, but then they can add whatever manufacturers they partner with to their uh, qualified charging list and we'll qualify those chargers. So through that, we've qualified four residential level two chargers, 21 commercial level two chargers, and then 20 DC fast chargers. And we've seen that that competition um, amongst the providers really does help our program be successful because they each kind of provide a different value proposition to the site host. 
Um, given the levels of funding that are remaining, as you'll see on the next slide, we don't intend to qualify any additional vendors at this time unless uh, additional funding becomes available. So this is kind of an overview of where we stand with our charging forward program today. Um, as of, this is actually should be as of June 30th, not June 1st. Um, we've approved almost 600 residential rebates um, and applications for that component really are continuing to increase as, as sales are increasing. And then on the commercial side, uh, we're over 70% subscribed for the level two chargers. And we're nearly uh, fully subscribed actually for the fast chargers, except for one key gap that I'll show on the next slide. So anyone that's applying at this point for the fast chargers, we're actually adding to a wait list and we already have almost 80 fast chargers on that wait list should additional funding be approved. So our, our fast charging rebates have been very successful uh, in part because Michigan's um, Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy or EGLE as we call it, is offering matching rebates to qualified customers through their Charge Up Michigan program, which is part of the Volkswagen settlement funds. Um, so far, customers have uh, applied for 1.7 million total and matching rebates from them. And that table kind of shows the status of where those rebates are. Uh, and then the, the map on the right is, is probably pretty difficult to see, but uh, I just want to call out that we do have coverage now across our territory, even up into the thumb, where in an emergency, you should be able to get to a um, fast charger within 50 miles. Um, and the one key gap that we're really still looking to fill with the funds that we currently have approved is I-75 between Detroit and Toledo, because that's a key corridor for us. Um, so apart from that, though, we are fully subscribed on the fast charging side um, and looking to see how we can uh, continue to support the climate there. I mentioned earlier that we also have a fleet component um, with charging forward and uh, this also follows the rebated make ready model and it was actually fully subscribed within the first year of operating our program. Um, so DTE led projects to bring partners together to seek additional funding sources um, federally or, or um, through the Volkswagen settlement funds again. And then also provide rebates for the charging infrastructure to support the deployment of eight public transit buses, electric public transit buses in our territory, and then six electric school buses. So we're really proud of those projects um, being the first in the state. Uh, and then the remaining fleet components that we supported, which were shared mobility, uh, delivery fleets and governmental also were fully subscribed, like I mentioned, uh, and we supported that through charging infrastructure rebates. So when we saw that, that, that there was this need for fleet um, focused programs, we wanted to build on that momentum of that pilot and the subscription of it and avoid any funding disruptions. So we filed a fleet focused pilot charging forward e-fleets at the end of last year. And we just received approval for that in March of this year. This pilot also has three primary components um, similar to charging forward or the original charging forward. It has education outreach and then again, the charging infrastructure rebates. Um, but the key uh, component here is really the fleet advisory services, which is focused on facilitating that customer's electrification journey. And I'll discuss that in more detail in a couple slides. So just a timeline for this, um, we did launch our website in May. Um, so the education outreach is already kicked off on the fleet side now. Um, and now we're in the process of hiring additional colleagues to get the remaining parts of the program stood up by the end of the year. And this is um, now in detail on our seven step advisory services process. And, and this was really a key lessons learned from our original fleet pilot element. Um, it's critical to success that DTE be there for the coordination and planning to help customers on their journey to electrification because this is a new technology for them. There's a lot of consideration, space considerations at a facility, power considerations, what chargers to use, uh, what EV models to consider, those kinds of things. So um, we've really created this turnkey offering now where um, we'll do an operational assessment of their fleet needs. Um, we'll recommend what EV models they should be considering. Uh, we'll do an assessment of the vehicles and their use cases to understand what their refueling requirements are. And then that obviously will inform what kind of charging 
and power upgrades they may need at their facility. Um, we'll help the customer uh, through their interconnection process to the grid or their service upgrade. Um, we'll provide the financial analysis and, and this is also like a sustainability analysis for them on how much they're improving emissions um, themselves and then ultimately support them through the project implementation. So you can find more information about this at our website, dtenergy.com forward slash charging forward eFleets. Um, so since the launch of Charging Forward two years ago, we've learned a lot. <laughs> and I wanted to really highlight just a few key learnings here um, as it relates to utilities and a lot of the questions that we typically get. So um, first for make ready costs and what it, what it actually costs to upgrade service for fast charging. We actually Im uh, implemented a process where we do a system analysis for our fast charging applications. So we were able to prioritize sites that required no or minimal upgrades, uh, which meant that right now we're averaging only $5,000 per site in service connection costs. And that enabled us to stretch our fast charging component from about 30 fast chargers to 90. So big win there for us and for the state to increase our coverage of fast charging with the same amount of dollars. Um, for time of use rates, this is another um, big thing that our stakeholders are interested in of how we can make sure that charging is off peak. And we do think that our time of use rates are a really effective way to do that. Um, we found that from our residential rebate, which requires the time of use enrollment, 91% of that charging takes place outside of the critical peak window of 3 to 7 p.m. Of our, on our system. So really big um, shift off peak and otherwise people typically just plug in when they get home from work if they're working in the office these days. Um, but other off peak incentives also work. So uh, we implemented a program called Bring Your Own Charger. And this actually uses our AMI meter data um, to ensure compliance with off peak charging. And then we send a customer a check up to $24 per quarter we did see a quick uptake in this program and we realized that it's because it doesn't require the time of use enrollment, which some customers are hesitant about. And it also doesn't require a specific charger. They can bring whatever, or they can use whatever level two charger they have at their home already. Um, so we do plan to keep that pilot in place with the residential rebate funds that we have remaining. Um, in terms of charging behavior, we've seen that site hosts are now more likely to charge a fee for usage at level two chargers, which were mainly free a couple of years ago. And in just the year, uh, we noticed a difference of idle time at the level two chargers from 85% to 64%. So really site hosts do have a lot of control and how they incentivize behavior at their chargers based on the fees that they um, require for usage. And then lastly, just uh, sort of um, facts on where we stand with pricing for the chargers that are in our program. The site hosts are allowed to charge uh, whatever they want to drivers since they own and operate the chargers. And we've uh, done some calculations on average. The level two chargers are an uh, e-gallon equivalent of about $1.75. And then the fast chargers are a little more expensive at an e-gallon equivalent of about $2.50. So although we've learned a lot, we've also um, identified where there are some key remaining gaps that need to be addressed to encourage EV adoption. And so um, those that's really the upfront premium of EVs, especially as it pertains to low income communities, ride hailing drivers, and then also transit agencies, because it really, again, if your mileage is high enough, the total cost of ownership makes sense today to switch, but that upfront cost can be a tough barrier to overcome. Uh, next is high powered charging for fleets. Um, the charging requirements can be quite large and expensive and there could also be space constraints at depots. So thinking through how we can support, uh, continue to support fleet electrification potentially through the, like more hub centralized locations of high powered charging. Um, also the process to install a level two charger is quite cumbersome and we get a lot of feedback on this through our residential rebate program on our post rebate survey. Um, it's extremely uh, onerous for the customer. There's like seven steps and there's um, research required at each step of what electrician to choose, what charger to choose, what pricing plan should you be on, those kinds of things. So really simplifying that process for the customer because they're not getting a ton of help at the dealerships. Um, 
Equitable access to charging is still a big focus for us, um, especially in environmental justice communities, multi-unit dwellings um, for cities that are cash strapped and then also um, in rural areas to make sure that there's access to fast charging, even though the business case is more challenging there. And then lastly, our ability to fund fast paced um, pilots is challenging given our regulatory construct and the leg that comes with the regulatory process for approval. So thinking through how we can be better suited to fund and participate in pilots that test key grid solutions in a way that um, evolves with the market on time. So we are exploring how we can expand expand charging forward um, beyond what we're doing today, not only extending it because we do expect uh, funding to run out for the passenger vehicle portion of the program within the next year, um, and then also expanding it to cover these remaining gaps that we've identified. Um, but in the meantime, we do continue to explore new technologies and drive our other EV related pilots forward. So. This is what's been kind of rolled under the charging forward umbrella, um, all of our other EV activities. And just to call out a few, um, you know, we're really excited about the smart charge pilot. This is one where we're working with Ford and GM um, through their open vehicle grid integration protocol developed by EPRI and others um, to control charging through the vehicle. Uh, and so we send signals to the customers through, I think that their app and then they participate or not, but understanding customer behavior, what incentivizes them to participate in those demand response programs will really help inform our future demand response programs to ensure that charging is, um, ha occurring at times when it's beneficial to the grid. Um, we're also really excited about the battery powered fast charging deployed at the Meyer um, off of I-75 near Auburn, or in Auburn Hills. Um, this uh, through eCami and it powers two uh, 75 kilowatt fast chargers that actually can, if only one is plugged in, it can um, share the power to be an output of 150 kilowatts and that's entirely powered by the battery. And then the battery trickle charges at more like 10 to 20 kilowatts. So a much, um, not as harsh of a draw on the grid. So trying to understand when it might make sense uh, on our system to do battery powered fast charging versus a system upgrade, an expensive system upgrade um, to understand that more. We're working closely with uh, Delta Electronics on their extreme fast charging pilot to test and develop charging up to 400 kilowatts. Um, and I think that really uh, covers the main points on this slide, but our, our distribution operations team is really focused on um, our strategic planning over the next 10 to 15 years. And as we continue to modernize our grid um, and harden our grid for reliability purposes, those investments will also continue to help EV adoption as, they, as that increases in our territory. That was all the slides I had if there were any questions. Oh yes, we have lots of questions for you. <laughs> uh, let's stop sharing your slides. Sure. And um, <clears throat> get to some of the questions. Uh, and I think one of the, and I, we, I really am impressed by the, the amount of work that you guys are doing across a wide variety of, <clears throat> of angles uh, related to this topic uh, of, of charging. Uh, it really seems that, uh, you know, from my, my own personal opinion is I, I'm, I really like the idea that you're really spreading out and looking at a lot from a lot of different angles. Um, one of the angles that people were talking about in, in, the, in the questions was the, the future. You know, you look like you're pretty, you're doing a nice job dealing with things right now. Mm -hmm. Will the power industry be able to manage a fleet of, again, this is in the US, 250 million vehicles charging regularly? Mm -hmm. uh, even within the, just looking at the DTE area, how many more power plants are actually gonna be needed? Yeah, so actually, um, so it varies by territory, right? Because we in, here in Michigan have, uh, a much peakier load are, we have to plan when we have the capacity to produce energy like two times the amount required on our hottest summer day. 
Well, that's like five days of the year, right? Maybe more in the future. But the point is that for the vast majority of the days of the year, we have a ton of excess capacity on the system. So this is far less a generation issue for us and far more a distribution issue. What we're more concerned about is when um, EVs cluster on a circuit and those transformers can then become quickly overloaded. And then managed charging needs to be more customized because even if everyone on that circuit, we incentivize them to start charging at 11 p.m., that could create a timer peak on that circuit um, where then it, it still is overloaded. So we are much more concerned on the distribution side for utilities that have a more temperate climate where they're, they're, uh, they don't have as much excess capacity in the system on the majority of their days of the year, it could be a generation issue for them. Um, that's why, like I know in California for their, um, they have a ton of solar capacity available in the middle of the day, what they call the duck curve. So they sometimes have programs where it's free charging between like 2 p.m. and 5 p.m., right? Which is when we don't want people to charge. Um, so it really just depends on the territory and the area that the utility is thinking and looking at their system and when the load should be coming to benefit everyone. So we don't see uh, a need for, I mean, this is like in the next 10 to 15 years, we don't see a need for, um, you know, major generation uh, kind of investments. It's more on the distribution side to be, and again, our team is already looking at hardening and modernizing our grid. So those investments that we're doing anyway will help with the EV adoption. And it's all about our planning standards too. So, you know, previously we would have done a certain level of transformer to support a residential circuit. And now we're probably going to be in the future upgrading our transformer requirements so that there can be more than five or six level two chargers on that transformer without an issue. Those kinds of planning things to um, when you're already upgrading a circuit anyway, it's cheaper to do that up front than to retroactively go back and upgrade it. Very good. Thank you. Um, one of the other questions uh, talks about the uh, engagement with other industries. Uh, how does the electric, electricity industry need engagement from other industries? Uh, for example, automotive, traditional refueling stations, local governments, for example, uh, to plan ahead for future uh, electricity needs for automotive. Yeah, so I think that um, given our location, obviously, we have a great relationship with the automakers. So we're fortunate in that respect. But I will say on that slide where I showed the national EV working groups, um, there's only uh, of the 10 on that slide, I think there's only one or two that are utility only. All the other ones are cross sectional across industries. They include the automakers, the charging companies, even some of the, um, you know, legislators or federal affairs types of organizations that are involved. Certainly the environmental groups also, um, because they want to make sure this is done in the right way and with equitable access again. So we're seeing a lot. I mean, we are constantly working across industries and I, I would say that other utilities are doing the same thing. Now, one of the things that, that's been part of the discussion uh, recently uh, is the difference between uh, building larger power plants versus smaller, local, more renewable power plants. Is this part of the plan for uh, a DTE story? So we, this all goes into our um, integrated resource plan, planning that we file, our IRP that we file every few years. And so we're looking at our power plants in that filing. We're looking at other distributed energy resources, um, you know, the impacts of microgrid on our forecasting, those kinds of things. So that all plays into the bigger picture. Um, I think though, right now, uh, since again, we're at like this hockey stick type of trajectory. We're just focused on what we can be doing to increase adoption today and then learn from that to prepare for the future. Okay, uh, another question for you. Um, uh, it's more of a statement. It says limiting consumer charging times uh, makes it more difficult for OEMs to convince consume customers to transition to EVs in high numbers. Um, I don't know if you can re want to respond to that, but it's yeah, one, of the, I, so one of the things they're thinking of. I think that the EV load is, 
unique in that it is flexible. So the driver doesn't really care when their vehicle is charging. They just care that it's charged by a certain time, whenever mm -hmm. that is that they need it. And so personal vehicles are parked like 95% of the time. So I think that we have a way to be creative with our solutions where it, it not only satisfies the system, but also the driver. And I agree that that could be a tougher selling point to customers. And maybe Chris is going to share some more thoughts on the customer perspective of that. But from our perspective, what we've seen in our own surveys is that range anxiety goes way down once you own an EV. Your perceived lack of charging infrastructure and, and the um, requirements to charge doesn't become as much of a fear once you actually have an EV. Um, and that's because, like Bruce said, the range on these vehicles is increasing. 80% of commutes are 40 miles or less. And these ranges that are coming out are 250 miles or more. You don't need to charge every day in that case. And when you do, you can top off or trickle charge when it makes sense for the system. So setting those, but those are the kinds of parameters that we're setting with our um, smart charge pilot where it's what, what uh, is the, what time do you want your vehicle charged by? Um, how, what is the state of charge that you want? Are you okay with a 75% state of charge on your battery or do you want it as close to 100% every time? Understanding those factors with drivers so that there, if there's a mutually beneficial solution is gonna be important. But I will say, um, you know, controlling timing, I'm much more liberal in, in wanting to do that at home, at the workplace where the vehicle is likely to be parked for more than four hours. I am much more concerned about Con managing the timing for charging at like fast charging because those are typically emergency needs or you're not you're in a situation where you can't wait for a longer period of time you need that charge in under an hour and so there you can try to incentivize it with uh making it more expensive which isn't ideal but as long as the driver is aware of that um pricing increase then at least they can respond to that accordingly i think that one uh, that one of the issues uh that we may may uh, face in the in the future have having to do with the uh, how much when you're when you're uh, charging publicly uh, how much is it costing me uh, will will we see those little signs that we have now for how much price per gallon and how much uh, how much are we charging for you know 20 minutes of charge or something like that on on in the future for uh, uh, public charging stations. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of the um, legis potential legislation that I'm seeing and reviewing shows, you know, pricing transparency uh, laws and things like that to make sure that people are aware of what they're paying. Um, and like I showed, it is still equivalent or cheaper than gas based on what we're mm -hmm. seeing in our territory today. Chris, did you have something you uh, want to add? Just, just quickly weigh in a, a few key points. Um, one is... Uh, as, as Kelsey mentioned, uh, a consumer with a vehicle with 250 mile range, uh, we, our analysis shows that those drivers can do over 90% of their driving without any public charging. And that the typical driver really is only gonna need about five or six public charging sessions a year uh, and the rest that they can do at home. And that's assuming they don't have another vehicle that they can take those. Uh, longer trips on. So yeah, just adding that into the Very good. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Kelsey, got another question for you uh, having to do with rural areas. Uh, do you have any charging fee terror for rural areas in order to make the transport policies more fair? I don't think I heard that right. The, do I have any charging? What was the question? Uh, charging fee tariffs for rural areas in order to make the transport policies more fair? So we do not, our electric pricing plans are available to any customer that qualifies for that rate class. Uh, and then we do not own the charging infrastructure today. So it's up to the site host to be charging a fee to recoup the costs. However, I will say that certainly um, uh, it's something that our Michigan Eagle Department is very focused on to, to maybe do a larger matching rebate uh, for these rural areas. And it's something that we're looking to address also with potentially an expansion of how we can uh, level the business case a little bit more to make it so that there is coverage across our territory, not just in the metro areas. And I think you did a great job of, of talking about the charging story uh, based on what we heard from uh, 
uh, Hans Eric about the <clears throat> battery reuse story. Is that anything that, that you could talk about? Yeah, so we're certainly looking at that. Um, and especially, again, this is like in our system, if for cars today, this would be, you know, 10 years from now, that kind of thing. But there's there, although the battery is no longer useful in the vehicle for propulsion technology, it is still very applicable for less demanding applications like stationary storage. And so those compare really well on our system with renewables. Um, at customers to peak shaves so that they have less demand charges. And then also when we're thinking about higher powered fast charging, that again can be paired at those sites so that instead of cutting off charging at 3 p.m., then it just switches to the battery. And now the battery is powering it when we're at a critical peak versus our grid. So there's a lot of ways that those batteries can be refurbished and reused without being recycled. Okay, very good. Um... I think that's all of the questions we have for you right now. I want to thank you, uh, uh, Kelsey, uh, for taking the time to, to speak with us today. Gave some really good information about what's going on right now and, and some things for the future as well of our first day on the powertrain strategy for the 21st century. Uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen and, and talk a little bit about some research that we usually do on powertrains. and. Um, this is, this is research that we've been doing for a number of years. <clears throat> it comes from the EPA's light duty automotive technology, carbon dioxide emissions and fuel economy trends, uh, 1975 to 2020. Uh, here we're looking at a variety of, of issues related to uh, uh, emissions and fuel economy. Um, looking at real world fuel economy, as well as a variety of emissions issues. For real world fuel economy, here we're looking at by company, comparing 19, uh, 2019 to 2020, uh, we're looking at some issues related to uh, who are the, uh, here we're looking high is better. So the, 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 the companies with uh, higher fuel economies include uh, Hyundai, uh, Honda, uh, Kia, Toy, uh, Subaru, um, and we also see uh, increases for Ford, uh, Honda, and uh, some decreases for uh, Kia and VW. This is by company. If you look at the passenger car story, uh, the uh, uh, Hyundai had the biggest increases and VW had the, the, most, the lowest decreases, the most decreases. Uh, in terms of fuel econ real world fuel economy for cars. From the truck side, <clears throat> the, uh, the leaders in, in light trucks, uh, Subaru and Honda, the, uh, the biggest increases in fuel economy from 2019 to 2020 were Hyundai and, and Kia and, and uh, but I'm sorry, on Hyundai decreases for uh, Kia and, and VW. In terms of emissions, by company, uh, real world emissions, CO2 emissions, the here lower is better. Uh, so uh, Honda, Hyundai uh, are the, the leaders in terms of uh, lower emissions, but in terms of decreases uh, in emissions, uh, FCA and Ford had some significant decreases uh, and well as, uh, and some, but some increases in emissions for by company for uh, Kia and VW. Uh, for cars uh, separately, uh, again, uh, lower is better. Uh, Honda uh, and, and Toyota are the leaders here. Uh, but when you look at the decreases from uh, 2019 to 2020, uh, Hyundai uh, was the, has the biggest uh, decrease in, in, in emissions and uh, VW has the biggest increase. Um, for light trucks, <clears throat> again, lower is better. Uh, Subaru and Honda uh, are the leaders here. Uh, but when you look at significant decreases uh, in emissions, you look at uh, see uh, Hyundai uh, increases for uh, for Kia and VW, and some some decent uh, uh, decreases for uh, FCA, Ford, and, and General Motors as well. Uh, for footprint issues, again, 2019 to 2020, 
Um, we see uh, there's no particular uh, goal for here. It's kind of like tracking where the companies are in terms of their vehicle footprints. Uh, see some decreases for FCA uh, and Ford as, as companies, increases for Hyundai and increases for VW. Uh, for cars, the story is uh, looking at uh, decreases for uh, FCA, uh, increase for, uh, for General Motors and increase for VW. For, uh, for light trucks, you're looking at uh, decreases in footprints for uh, significant ones for Ford, uh, but increases in, uh, for a Hyundai and Kia, uh, and, but also uh, uh, decreases in footprint for uh, FCA and General Motors as well. One of the things we looked at <clears throat> was comparing how the companies have been doing from 2014 to 2020. Uh, when you look at real world fuel economy uh, by company, again, this is, as I said, EPA data, um, uh, better, higher is better. The uh, Honda, Hyundai, uh, uh, Subaru are, are leaders here. They're the biggest increase in fuel economy came from Honda uh, as, as a company, decrease, biggest decrease from VW from 2014. Now remember 2014 is one, in general, companies were supposed to increase uh, 5% annually according to the uh, Obama administration uh, goals. Uh, this, this, the, these do not include credits that they were used, but it, they are sales weighted. They, uh, for fuel economy for cars by company, the uh, <clears throat> increases, significant increases for Hyundai and Kia, uh, as well as other companies. Uh, Honda's increased, uh, GM increased for, uh, for fuel economy, uh, uh, slight decrease though for, for VW. Uh, you would expect, and, and Nissan is, is not much of an increase as well. Uh, from 2014, one would expect more from uh, uh, it, more increases from and in, for fuel economy, for light trucks, uh, some significant increases for fuel economy for Ford, uh, as well as FCA and General Motors, uh, and and for uh, uh, and for and for VW across the board. You see increases. It's a matter of how much have these companies uh, increased their fuel economy. When you look at emissions, <clears throat> again, lower is better. The, you want to see decreases. You see decreases for Honda. Uh, you see decreases for almost everybody, but no decreases for General Motors uh, uh, and an and increase actually in emissions for VW. When you look at the car story, you're looking at uh, the, again, lower is better. Uh, Honda, uh, taking the lead here and, and Toyota. Uh, you're looking at significant decreases in uh, emissions for, for GM, some for Ford, uh, significant for uh, Hyundai and Kia. Uh, so, and when it comes to the light trucks, uh, you see the, uh, the big three FCA, Ford and General Motors uh, having significant decreases in light trucks. Uh, there should be decreases across the board here, and, and, and that is the case. Uh, and uh, Toyota as well with significant uh, uh, decreases in, in, in emissions for light trucks. Uh, footprint story uh, from 2014, kind of interesting to see how the companies may have changed. Uh, we always hypothesize that the footprint of vehicles might change because of the uh, need to increase fuel economy. <clears throat> we see instead some uh, increases in footprint. Um, probably it has a lot to do with the uh, uh, increase in, in light truck sales uh, because light trucks tend to have uh, larger footprints than, than passenger cars. And this could have, a, and, this, and across the board, this has been a tremendous growth from 2014 to 2020 in light trucks. Probably the reason why you see the, the, the uh, differences in, in increases by company. For cars, uh, very, very little uh, increases, uh, pretty flat across the board uh, with Ford increasing the footprint of cars by, by a little bit. 
Um, but for light trucks, uh, you'll see some uh, decreases in, in light trucks for uh, General Motors and, and Ford, uh, uh, increases for, uh, for Hyundai. Uh, so some real differences, and this is really manufacturer strategies about how they were going to manage their uh, fuel economy and, and their fleet of vehicles and based on what they thought their consumers uh, were, were wanting, wanting to see and, and purchase. Uh, so that's all I wanted to, to share with you in, in terms of some of our, our uh, secondary uh, research, looking at secondary sources to find out uh, about uh, talking about fuel economy. Our, and, and I'd like to get into our, our next speaker, Chris Harto, who's the uh, a senior policy analyst uh, Transportation and of uh, for, for transportation and energy at uh, Consumer Reports is going to be talking about uh, as we were talking earlier. One of the key issues looking at the transition to electric vehicles is willingness to purchase these vehicles. Uh, thank you for joining us, Chris. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, I'm going to talk about the consumer. As you mentioned, I'm going to talk about the consumer side of the equation. Uh, let me present my screen here. All right. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about some consumer perspectives on electric vehicles. Uh, so just a little bit of background on consumer reports. We're an independent nonprofit member organization that represents over 6 million consumers. Uh, you probably know us best for our uh, testing and rating of new vehicles. Uh, the picture on the right is our test track up in Connecticut where we independently buy from a dealer a uh, large swath of, of new vehicles every year and put them through a rigorous course of over 50 independent tests uh, to do our own independent testing and rating of those vehicles. In addition, we also do a lot of uh, survey and other research around the auto market. <laughs> what I'm gonna talk to you about today comes from really two main research products. Uh, the first is our uh, 2020 electric vehicle survey. Uh, and the other is a, a research report we, we released last fall on uh, electric vehicle ownership costs. And both of those are available on our website. So I'm going to start off with uh, just some talk about some overall EV interest results. Uh, so we asked consumers what their thoughts were on buying or leasing a new plug-in electric vehicle. This is a survey of about 3,000 uh, U.S. adults who have an, a valid driver's license. Uh, as you can see here, it sort of depends on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist here. Uh, we, we have 4% uh, of consumers who say they definitely plan to get an EV for their next vehicle. This doesn't sound like very much, but last year EVs only accounted for about 2% of the market. So, so this would represent a doubling of the EV market if, if only those consumers bought electric vehicles. Uh, then we have a further 27% who who would at least consider getting an EV for their next vehicle, and another 40% who, who have interest in electric vehicles, but maybe not for their next vehicle. So that gives a total interest of about 70% of consumers who are at least curious about buying an EV for their next, curious about buying an EV. However, that's, that's where we are today. There's a number of forces uh, going on in the market uh, that are really driving momentum towards electrification. The first of which is that we're really in an explosion of consumer choice in the EV market. You know, prior to about a year ago, if you wanted an EV, an affordable EV, you pretty much had to buy a compact car. Um, and, and as our automotive industry folks on, on the call here, uh, know that that's, that's not the most popular vehicle. Only about 12% of U.S. vehicle sales are compact cars. Uh, consumers want pickup trucks, SUVs, crossovers. That's what consumers are buying. And they're finally getting some options in those markets 
in the electric segment. So, so really expect to, as EVs branch into those other segments, to really see sales pick up uh, as, as automakers are delivering EVs where consumers want to buy them. Another factor is really that's driving a lot of this and, and is driving the automaker investments is the rapidly declining battery costs. Uh, battery costs have declined about 90% in the past decade. That really is enabling automakers to build compelling, relatively affordable electric vehicles with sufficient range. Uh, we're, we're seeing you know, typical electric vehicles now falling in about 250 to 300 miles of range, which we think is kind of the sweet spot for consumers. And, and that's finally becoming you know, more, more of a reality, more, more realistic for consumers. But consumers don't have to wait for cost parity for, for those battery costs to drop even further to start saving money. Our analysis has shown that, that for many of the EVs on the market, the popular EVs on the market, consumers can save money uh, even in the first year of ownership if they, if they finance their vehicle. These, these results show three popular EVs, the Leaf, Bolt, and Prius Prime compared to the most efficient, best-selling, and highest-rated vehicles in their class, in this case, compact hatchbacks, and, and their ownership costs over the, the, for the period of the first owner's ownership. Uh, and, and while those vehicles are more expensive to purchase, uh, they, they make up for that higher purchase price uh, in, in ownership savings by saving about 50% in maintenance and about 60% in fuel cost. Um, and, and for owners who, who finance their vehicle, those, those savings outweigh the increase in, pay, increase in payment uh, over that first year. That's, and that's just uh, the mainstream vehicles. Uh, really, really where automakers are going and why they're going there is that the performance picture for electric vehicles is so compelling. Uh, here, here we show the lifetime ownership savings again for, uh, for six relatively popular electric vehicles and compare them with a top rated vehicle, which is a more, more typical consumer vehicle, as well as a vehicle that matches the zero to 60 acceleration performance. For consumers who value that acceleration and, and they want that in a vehicle, it's really hard to beat an, an electric vehicle in that performance space. And that's why we're seeing a lot of EVs coming out, especially in the luxury space and in the performance space, because it's really hard for an ICE vehicle to compete with the performance that an EV can deliver. Um, and on, on the right here, I have a quote from uh, GM's uh, technology chief, that cost parity is difficult to define, but it's already here with luxury vehicles. So like many things in the automotive industry, uh, electrification is really gonna, gonna start with that luxury segment and trickle down to the, to the mainstream segments. Uh, and and the, the, the savings there is just, uh, is massive. In, in the performance space and in, in segments where performance has a higher value to consumers. So digging a little bit more into some of our uh, survey research, I'm uh, gonna look at a few key, uh, key trends that we're seeing we're able to pull out of our, our survey analysis. First is, is a general generational shift taking place. Uh, this, this graph here shows uh, the percent of new vehicle spending. So this is total spending on new vehicles from uh, the, the blue line is, is baby boomers and older. And, and the, the green line is Gen X, millennials, and, and Gen Z. And as you can see, this is just a four-year period. The shift from... Uh, Baby, baby boomers and older dominating the market to, to really taking, taking a back seat as, as baby boomers uh, start to hit that retirement age 
and they they just spend less on on things like new cars uh you know the the millennials and and younger are, are really picking up the slack and, and making up a bigger portion of that new car market with that comes some uh you know shifts in priorities shifts in values uh you know the younger buyers are are more tech savvy they're more more climate conscious and and so therefore there there could be some implications uh for the electric vehicle market based on this generational shift i'll note that by 2030 uh where a lot of automakers have have sales targets uh even the youngest baby boomers will hit have hit retirement age and and the market's really going to be driven by by the millennials who will be reaching their peak earning years and and even younger younger consumers um, so so what does that mean in terms of consumer interest uh, so this this graph breaks out our um, consumer interest results by generation and you can can see as as you go from older to younger uh, interest in buying an electric vehicle goes way up uh, so you know so this the silent generation you know people who are already retired you know it's it's harder to convince them to, to buy a new new technology uh, new new type of vehicle but then when you go to the to the younger end, the Gen Xers and especially the millennials are far more comfortable with, with the new technology and, and show a much larger interest in purchasing electric vehicles. So if you're just looking at the past and past uh, consumer behavior around vehicle purchases uh, in, in making your plans over, over what you're gonna sell, how you're gonna sell it, I think you're missing a big piece of the picture here and that this generational shift will really help drive the electric vehicle market over the next decade. Another factor that we saw that really can drive up interest is, is actually direct experience with electric vehicles. Um, we took our results uh, from our survey and we cross-tabulated them with, with a, a metric we created based on what people told us their direct experience with electric vehicles are. So we asked three questions. Do you know somebody who has an electric vehicle? Have you ever ridden in an electric vehicle? And have you ever driven an electric vehicle? So the, these three questions we use to create, to assign a score of zero to three to consumers. This, you know, how much, you know, maybe you've heard a lot about electric vehicles, but how much have you actually directly experienced an electric vehicle. Um, and, and just for comparison, a, a score of three is basically equivalent to the level of experience that your average 16 year old has as they go to take their driver's test. You know, they, they know somebody who has an EV, they've driven a, a car, they've driven one, and, and they've been a passenger in one. So this is a very low level of experience that we're, low, low bar we're setting for experience. But the results are dramatic. Uh, so this this also breaks this breaks out our uh, consumer interest based on the experience score for the consumer. As you can see, consumers who have no experience with an electric vehicle are much less likely to be interested in buying one. You know, they, they they just don't know know much about it, and most people aren't going to make a major purchase. Uh, you know, a, a thirty or forty thousand dollar purchase on something they don't know much about, they've never experienced. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. On the other side of the equation, for consumers who have that very base level of experience with an EV, again, the level of experience your average sixteen-year-old would have as they take their driver's test, their interest in buying an electric vehicle goes way up. Sixty-five percent of consumers who have actually driven an EV and know somebody who has an EV are interested, are, are willing to consider one for their next vehicle. A full 94% are at least interested in buying an electric vehicle. So if you're an automaker, if you're trying to sell electric vehicles, the number one thing you can do is train your dealers, make sure there's electric vehicles on the lot and get butts in seats. 
get consumers behind the wheel of an electric vehicle. And once you do, I guarantee you that that consumers don't want electric vehicles excuse will go away. <clears throat> once consumers experience these vehicles, they like them. Uh, it's, it's just Im impossible to ignore the, that instant torque that the consumers experience when they push down on the gas pedal on their first EV. It really it just lights you up and, and really helps sell the vehicle. But you have to get consumers behind the wheel. You can't just talk to them about it. You can't just show them commercials or, or you know, read reviews on consumer reports. You really need to get them behind the wheel in the seat and really experience an electric vehicle for themselves. And that shows up in our, uh, in our <clears throat> owner satisfaction surveys as well. Once consumers buy an EV, they love it. Uh, in, in, our, in our annual owner satisfaction survey, four of the top 10 vehicles of all vehicles on the market were electric vehicles. Uh, Tesla, electric only brand, is the number one brand for owner set for customer satisfaction. Number one. And it's not just Tesla. 13 of the 15 EVs that are currently on the market that CR has tested have received above average consumer satisfaction ratings. So it's not just Tesla. Consumers love who buy EVs, love them, and they're gonna tell their friends and they're gonna tell their neighbors and that's gonna help drive sales over time. It's, it's knowing somebody, it's experiencing the EV, it, it's really gonna help drive the market. Finally, uh, talk a little bit about um, some policy support maybe potentially on the way to help, help prop up the market and, and drive it even further. Um, in the American Jobs Plan, there's $174 billion set aside for electrification between consumer incentives and, and strong in investments in, in charging infrastructure. That's, that's going to just, you know, assuming at least some of that passes our Congress, that's really going to help, uh, you know, bolster the consumer and, and help with the charging infrastructure questions. We also are, are looking at, at, there's some improved federal clean car standards coming down the road. Uh, EPA and NHTSA are expected to announce their phase one uh, standards uh, that would go through 2026 sometime uh, in the next month or two. Uh, we expect those standards to, to significantly increase uh, the required improvements in, in greenhouse gas emissions and fuel economy above the current uh, safe rule standards. And we expect the administration to, to go further and set, set a second set of standards uh, through the beginning of next decade that really uh, is going to help, help them meet some of the climate goals they've set out for themselves and really drive uh, the market towards uh, more electrification. Finally, Regardless of what the federal government does, states are moving forward. Uh, California is in the rulemaking process for their advanced clean cars two rule from which they're proposing uh, a 100% ZEV by 2035. That will still allow uh, plug-in hybrids and some other, uh, other vehicles, but, but largely 100% you know, vehicles with a plug by 2035 and a number of states and Canada have committed to joining them. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of policy support behind put driving the momentum be, behind the electric revolution. And some quick conclusions. So we have major automaker investments, growing consumer choice, approaching cost parity, strong consumer value proposition, generational shift that benefits electrification, increased consumer awareness and experience, and strong policy support. All of these things are, are there to help drive a transportation revolution that, that seems very likely at this point, if not inevitable.
that is my time ready for questions. Very good. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> Got a few questions for you. Uh, one of the things that uh, you, you mentioned in your in your presentation was, you know, you're looking at the generational issues. And what did uh, income, what role did income play in, in your analysis? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know. We didn't look, certainly, we didn't look at income and generation. Uh, from an income perspective, there is definitely a a higher interest in electric vehicles by, by higher income consumers. I will note that not just EV buyers, but all new car buyers uh, tend to be higher income. Uh, the, the most new cars are purchased by consumers with above average income. And so, you know, it's, it's not surprising that most EVs are new vehicles. There's not a whole lot of used vehicles on the market right now. Uh, so it's not surprising that that higher income consumers are going to be more likely to buy a new EV. Okay, yeah, it is it is one of the issues that that uh, of course that's where the the incentives come in, right? There are some opportunities if the incentives are 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 properly properly placed that you could generate the another wave beyond the uh, higher income folks. Who are, who are purchasing the EVs. Um, another question for you uh, had to do with uh, plug-in hybrids. Um, uh, the questioner says, many would argue they are the best of both worlds in many different ways. Can you briefly comment on Consumer Reports research and perspective on plug-in hybrids? Uh, I, I personally think plug-in hybrids are a, a great option for a lot of consumers. Uh, they're, they're a good um, kind of transition path to electrification, uh, letting people experience uh, what uh, an electric vehicle can be like uh, with, without having, you know, the potential for range anxiety. Uh, I myself have been strongly considering a RAV4 Prime. Uh, it's, it's a really cool vehicle, rates really well with uh, consumer reports. Um, so, so I think at least in, in the short and medium term, I think uh, plug-in hybrids can, can be a good solution. We, we actually found that the maintenance costs for, for plug-in hybrids actually were, were more closer to, to battery electric vehicles than they were to, to gasoline vehicles. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of benefits. You can get a lot of the, the cost savings benefits if you plug in every day and uh, with, without having the range anxiety. So, so I think at least in the near term, they're gonna make a lot of sense. As battery costs continue to, to drop lower and lower, um, you know, I, don't, I don't know if plug-in hybrids will ever achieve cost parity with gasoline vehicles. And that, that may be where, where battery electrics can, will take over uh, and become more popular uh, down the road. But, but for now, a plug-in hybrid is a great option for many consumers. There's some research that, that's come out recently uh, looking at the plug-in hybrid story. And I think it, was, it came out of Europe and it was kind of focused on people who were, I guess you would call misusing uh, plug-in hybrids, uh, meaning they were not plugging them in. And because they had an engine, the engine would, would be driving the vehicle, but the engine is not optimized for uh, driving by itself. And what they were finding was that uh, it was creating problems, uh, more pollution than if, if it had been just a, a regular ICE vehicle that was uh, a more modern uh, ICE vehicle. Uh, I think this is getting, getting some play in, in China as well, uh, because the, it used to be that uh, Shanghai was really focusing on, on, on plug-in hybrid, uh, plug yeah, plug hybrids. And uh, they were giving incentives more than they were giving incentives for uh, uh, battery electrics. Uh, but within the last year, they've, uh, they completely changed their strategy. And, and now they're giving less uh, incentives for plug-in hybrids than they are for BEVs. 
Now that that could have to a lot to do with you know energy policy as well as industrial policy uh, about where the, the the Chinese government is heading. But uh, there are a couple issues I think that that I, people need really need to consider uh, about the plug-in hybrid story. Yeah, I mean, you know, you you can't consumers are going to use their vehicles how how they how they use their vehicles. Um, you know, if, if they, you know, it's hard, hard to, to force somebody to plug, you can't force somebody to plug in, um, you know, they, they can choose to spend more money filling it, their tank with gas than, than filling it with electricity, spending, you know, two, two, two and a half times more to run their vehicle. If they, you know, some consumers will make that, that choice. And, um, so yeah, it's, it's complicated, but you know, for, for people who want to save money, they're a great option. I think that's a good point, uh, Chris. The, another uh, question that, that came up was the correlation with home ownership. Uh, did you guys look at that any in, in your uh, analysis? Uh, we, we, we have some of that information. I don't have the, the results off, offhand. Um, again, uh, EV purchases are, are likely in the near term are likely to be higher income consume. The type of consumers who buy new cars tend to be the type of consumers who own a home. And many times it's their consumers who own multiple cars. So, so the consumers who are in the market for an EV or any in the market for a new car today are the type of consumers who are well position to take advantage of an electric vehicle. You know, down the road, as we get more electric vehicles on the road, we have more electric vehicles in, in the used market. Um, certainly that, that charging question is gonna get bigger and bigger. Uh, but for the near term, as we're trying to go from 2% of sales to 4% of sales to 8% of sales to 12% of sales in, in those ranges where we're gonna be over the next five or six years, I, I don't see charging at home being a major barrier. Because again, we're, talking, we're still talking about growing a relatively small portion of the new car market. And the new car market only applies to really the most affluent 30% of Americans. 70% of vehicle purchases in the US are used car purchases. So on one side, on one hand, there's an equity issue, but on the, on the other, and, and that's, that's an equity issue inherent in the new car market. Um, but, but from an, from the future of electrification and the, the adoption of electric vehicles, uh, I don't see it being a major challenge. And then in the first half of this decade, I think it grows as, as the market grows. And, and we need to have the policy supports and um, in place now so that it doesn't become a problem in the future. Yeah, good point, Chris. Uh, they, I, I know that the, some research out of California said that uh, the, of the EV owners, 90% charge at home. So it, it just shows you that how big the home ownership uh, piece is uh, of the puzzle. And like you said, it's really, a, a, if you look at short term, it's a, a more of a short-term issue rather than a than a, than a yeah. uh, uh, I, longer term. I believe the U.S. housing stock is around seventy-five to eighty percent single-family homes. Yeah, so I think yeah, yeah. It, there's a lot of lot of single-family homes that can take an EV in the driveway. Yeah, very good. Um, were you looking at uh, different geographies when you were looking at your analyses of different parts of the country? Uh, uh, we we did do some state-based surveys. Uh, we 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 surveyed a few specific uh, states, um, and and there is some slight variation across those those states in in interest in EVs. Um, you know, west west coast, east coast uh, states tended to to be have a little more knowledge and therefore interest in electric vehicles than. Than some of the states in the in the Midwest, uh, in the South, uh, but but I think that's that's more of a an education and experience uh, factor than than a than anything inherent 
in the in the interest in those areas. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, your uh, your the story about the states is our, our lead in to our next speaker, uh, uh, Kara Cockleman, who's going to be sp uh, talking about the issues related to the uh, uh, fuel taxes that are 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 probably plaguing uh, uh, state legislatures as we go along here. Um, uh, thank you again, Chris. Uh, Kara is the uh, uh, Professor of Transportation of Engineering Civil Department, uh, Depart Engineering Department of Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, welcome, Kara. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. I'm going back and forth this week between the Automated Road and Transportation Systems Conference and, and this one today. So um, delighted though to be asked to speak about EVs rather than AVs, which is at my normal beat this summer. Um, and I do have kind of an economist background. My minors at both the undergrad and graduate level were in econ, also have masters in city planning, and then those three civil engineering degrees uh, so this is a, a topic near and dear to my heart. But I can tell you EVs are definitely not the reason DOTs are struggling for cash. And I know you all know this. EVs are a tiny piece of the market, as you've heard. It, the gas tax and the uh, Grover Norquist pledge to not raise taxes is the problem. And only a few states you know, really have the guts with state legislators to raise uh, that portion. And we're nowhere near. Uh, we're nowhere near Europe and China and Japan. Uh, I think Australia also has finally increased its gas tax and probably Canada. So we're real laggards. We're right there with Venezuela and Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so Venezuela is giving gas away for free because it's got nothing else. Um, unfortunately, terrible, horrific situation that has happened there. And, and we're, you know, giving gas away way too cheap. So First things first, you absolutely should raise the gas tax to, you know, I'd say at least a dollar per gallon. You can put a collar on it if you want, um, so that if for some reason there's a shakeup in oil markets globally and the price jumps, they can um, bring the tax down so that it doesn't get above, I don't know, four dollars a gallon or something. That's still way below what they're paying in Europe, as you probably know. So they get a much a nicer size vehicle there, something that's a lot less aggressive, a lot less dangerous, a lot less sight line limiting obviously and less noisy uh, and less polluting, which has really gotten us into a bind climactically. Um, and in addition to losing about a, over 100,000 people early every year, not just from the diesel exhaust, and, and really it is diesel, it's like 10 times as bad as your uh, gasoline vehicles. So drop your diesel trucks, folks, um, as fast as you can. I know it's really hard on the heavy duty fleet, but there are options coming, thank goodness. Um, and in the carbon, emissions of the sulfur dioxide becomes a, a fine particulate matter. So lodge is deep in your lungs. So you're going to die about five years early, um, or a lot of people are dying uh, five years early, uh, far more than are dying on our roads. Uh, but of course, they're usually in their 70s uh, when they do that. So it's not as, um, as sad a situation when we lose a, a 20 year old or a 10 year old on the roadway. So I'm going to go uh, into these other details now. I know the big issue that everybody thinks is such a big issue, but it's really a red herring is the fact that EVs aren't paying their fair share. Um, and so <laughs> it's obviously an issue, but it's nowhere near as big an issue as our spending a dollar per gallon every year, or excuse me, a dollar for every gallon on the military to protect the Middle East pipeline uh, situation and to keep that price stable. And so, uh, or keep it artificially low, basically. So um, as the number of EVs rises, I know that there's this tiny erosion in the gas tax revenues per vehicle mile traveled. So VMT is vehicle miles traveled. And uh, state DOTs um, have long seen the gas tax erode has nothing to do with EVs, of course. It just has to do with uh, fuel economy and um, incredible inflation, especially when China was uh, preparing for the Olympics in 2008. I'm sure you guys know that the price of steel and, um, and cement, and of course, China continues to build, and this is a global market. It's not just a global market for petroleum. It's a global market for lots of materials. And so they've um, had to really focus on maintenance, which I don't think is a bad thing. So they haven't been able to expand as much. I really do think we have a lot of roads 
um, if you look at aerial images of our country versus others, the transportation system absolutely dominates and uh, especially when you consider the density of the population and the other activity sites around our roadways. So just focusing on maintaining the existing system is not a bad thing, especially with autonomous vehicles coming and, and hopefully um, smarter systems. And with that too, pricing, real-time pricing and credits to ensure that we all have equal access to that network that we purchased or we paid for um, sort of as a, a community. So it's a public good, it's like a park, um, but not nearly as lovely as a park. I'm afraid it's probably the ugliest thing in our, our um, environment. And that's part of why Venice is my favorite city in the world, because you get rid of all of that uh, roadway infrastructure and the gas stations and things like that and parking a uh, lot. So, uh, but anyhow, we've got a lot of it. And um, so the DOTs have really had to hunker down and focus on that. And they're still hurting. And only, you know, some state legislators have enough guts and courage to raise that gas tax, which has sat still for almost 30 years. Um, and then there's many states that have added a, a, a registration fee for electric vehicles and maybe a hybrid electric vehicle as well to help kind of reflect that they're not paying uh, anything for that system, although I'm sure their owners pay a uh, high high property taxes. Um, I know here in Austin, we have very high property taxes and that pays for a lot of the local roads. Um, of course, the reg fees also help pay for enforcement and other things. So they're contributing um, and they're sometimes buying tires. They fortunately don't have to do oil changes. I know our previous speaker was talking about how people love these things. I was being interviewed by uh, CBS out of Houston yesterday. And um, I just said, you know, it's a totally different experience. It's like buying a rocket ship. Um, we have a Tesla Model 3, the, the shorter range one, and we have a Prius. And, um, you know, it's just a whole new technology. I, I love the one pedal driving, for example. Our garage smells awesome. Uh, but of course, lots of people don't have garages. And so they're, uh, they do have to think a little more strategically than my household does about recharging. And we only plug in like once a week. I don't know. <laughs> and if we're, uh, you know, if we're traveling long distance, we'll plug in, uh, we'll make sure that the hotel that we're headed to has a place uh, to plug in. Um, the reg fees are very simplistic. They ignore actual use. So uh, this is, you know, the kind of a big issue. And, uh, and some people want to charge EVs far more than they should be paying. Of course, they do enjoy uh, some purchase fee subsidies still um, because, you know, it was a, an, a marvelous but expensive technology to get going. And we're very lucky that the battery prices have fallen. Uh, but it's still that sticker shock on the upfront fee is, is, is significant. And so uh, Americans are so simplistic themselves and, and human beings are so myopic and they're, they're not engineers, they're not doing spreadsheets to decide which vehicle to buy like some of you may be doing. Um, but it, so they're, they're really not thinking about the long-term cost savings of the vehicles, which are kind of at parity right now, if you were to do this and hold on to your vehicle. Of course, if you wanna sell it every two years, then yeah, but like our, our previous speaker was saying, only 30% of um, you know, households really buy new vehicles. A lot of people are in the used vehicle market. So uh, gasoline is a hazardous material. I don't want my kids touching it. I don't want you touching it. Um, we really need more uh, gas tax, absolutely. I mean, we need to triple it ideally. I guess if we were sane and um, you know, much smarter about protecting the environment, um, I think we've destroyed 50% of all animal life in the last 50 years or 60% of all animal life. So horrific, um, you know, and that's partly due to this, this, this destruction of the environment, which is used to build these roads and these new land development, the population increase. Um, but anyhow, it's, it's a real problem and the climate is, is a big part of it. And so this is a, a big place for us to reduce that footprint. Um, so there are of course, all sorts of options out there to, to catch those, those EVs um, and there are added plug-in uh, prices. There's also hybrid prices. I think I'll, I'll go ahead and use my, my laser here. So in, in many states where we're seeing um, an added price, there's gonna be a, maybe a 50% of that um, battery only electric vehicle um, added price will be added to the HEV registration. And this is this is really minimal stuff, you guys. <laughs> Reg fees are, are quite low, but so are gas taxes. I think the average vehicle may pay like 400 a year in gas taxes, um, or probably <laughs> less than that. I think we pay about, uh, you know, two cents a mile in, in gas taxes. Uh, and so 
we pay probably we may pay in the summer maybe a, a cent or something per mile or probably less for added refining uh, to help reduce the ozone implications of this hazardous material because um, with uh, the carbon the volatile organic com compounds um, and and the NOx in the presence of sunlight and things like that produce ozone which causes all sorts of health issues but not those early deaths those early deaths are really due to the fine particulate matter lodging deep in your lungs which is primarily due to diesel users. So get rid of diesel wherever you can. This includes the buses in your city, of course. Um, so we've got 28 states, that's pretty good. Um, you know, they, they definitely have already thought about this. They probably are higher than would be uh, optimal and the gas tax is, is lower than optimal, even in California, even in Massachusetts and the places that have raised it. So that fuel tax, you can see Hawaii's pretty high here, I guess of Pennsylvania, California, it is slowly eroding due to inflation over time. And so you're seeing some of these lines go down. Arkansas, Georgia, very low uh, state taxes. Um, we've got the federal tax in here and sort of the average state tax, but you know, often eroding over time because of the, the minor inflation that we have. And Inflation, a couple percent of inflation is probably a good thing if you talk to economists. Deflation uh, would be a real problem. And uh, we're not, we're not uh, facing that right now in this country. We haven't, uh, Japan's really the only country I know of that's had that issue. But Pennsylvania, um, you know, has tried to improve um, the, the tax there. So uh, these are sort of the maximum um, that we're seeing across the U.S. And it's still tiny compared. So this is 40 cents, you know, maybe. Um, a gallon and still, and this is in year $2,000, I should say. So this does, um, this isn't real adjusted values. Um, but we could tax, try to tax um, the Teslas as they charge at the garage meter. The garage meter costs about 600 bucks to install, or, or it's not really a meter. Uh, I don't have a meter at my at my Tesla a charging point in my garage. I just, to install a level two device, which all the Europeans have, by the way, they run on 220 volt naturally in their homes and businesses. But, um, you know, to install that kind of device inside one's garage costs about 700 bucks. And, um, and then to install another meter, I don't know, maybe 150 or something. And to try to tax that, that would be just silly uh, because energy, uh, electricity is, is so cheap. And these vehicles are so darn efficient. They don't waste all that heat the way an internal combustion engine would. So you end up paying like two cents a mile. I get about five uh, miles per kilowatt hour on my, my Tesla. Uh, I should really say my husband's Tesla, but he's letting me drive it this week. <laughs> so it's our Tesla. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty amazing. So we, you know, here in Texas, we pay about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So it might be two cents per mile, which is what the, the whole entire gas tax is in this country on, on most vehicles. I guess my Prius pays less than one cent per mile. And um, so they haven't increased in almost three decades. And at a minimum, of course, these should be tied to inflation um, to avoid some of this erosion. But we've also got really heavy inflation in uh, the materials that our DOTs have used over the years and, 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 and labor and things like that. So, um, you know, they're, they're certainly not building much anymore and um, maintenance, including re rehabilitation, which involves new materials is, is, is very expensive. So of course you could have a VMT fee, uh, it is more equitable. It'd be great if it were odometer based. Um, of course, some vehicles get wrecked uh, midway through the year before they can get a new odometer read and maybe you can't read their odometer in some cases. And uh, it's much harder to tamper with an odometer than it used to be. So I, I could see this being a reasonable way where um, people take photos and they use some special app and the dongle maybe. It'd be great to have the dongles uh, more, more in use, but um, they often do require cellular fees. Um, which might be $5 a month per vehicle, which is kind of an issue. But at some point, you know, reading that, that VMT, um, it's nice because it, instead of being um, paid uh, once a year, whether or not you use the vehicle that year, it is paid as, as you go. And, um, you know, just higher fees to make people think more about driving this, this dirty, loud, dangerous, heavy thing around. Um, would, would help moderate congestion. So I would recommend gas taxes at $2 per gallon in this country. I know that'd be really scary for a lot of, uh, of 
people, um, but it's not on all fuel use in this country, it's just on the driving. And so there's about 200 refineries, I think, in the country. So it's a really easy fee, that gas tax versus trying to track 300 million vehicles and their odometer readings, that's a total nightmare compared to charging at the refinery, okay? So refinery-based tax, tax is way easier, so much lower administrative cost to doing that. Um, and it does really help moderate emissions and congestion and noise. Um, and as you know, uh, congestion emerges um, in large part because we're not paying the full cost of our travel. And it's long been a problem. Um, it's about $200, $200 billion a year. So it's less than $1,000 per person per year, whereas the cost of crashes are on the order of $3,000 per person per year in this country. And I don't know if you know, but the fatality rate per mile traveled jumped about 20, I think over 20% last year um, because we were traveling about 13% fewer miles. I know it felt like way more than 13% to me. So it's amazing that we just fell 13% and um, people are going faster and not driving as well. Um, so congestion emerges when demand exceeds supply. This happens all the time to you at the airport as you're trying to get through security or check into a hotel, um, you know, or get in a checkout line for your groceries. And um, people are really only considering the, the direct cost to them of these choices they make. And it's not just, you know, which route to take, it's where you're going and how you're getting there and at what time of day you leave. That departure time choice is so important to congestion. If we could control that, boy, we could get rid of congestion. We have more than enough roadways, believe me, for everyone to drive uh, anywhere they want if they would just drive in the middle of the night for us uh, half the time. <laughs> So um, they're ignoring the delays that they're imposing on those that are basically behind them in the traffic stream that may be on a different road, but if your queue backs up and affects the upstream signals or on ramps and things like that, you're having big effects. And those of you can remember from Econ 101, you've got this demand function going down here. You've got a supply function going up. This is what the traveler will see is the average cost of his or her travel. Um, but what is happening is the average cost or, or travel time is slowly rising as you add traffic to a roadway um, because the marginal cost is pulling it upward. And that's that added cost that I would add to the roadway if I were this incremental traveler at this location and on this x-axis, I would really be adding this much. I would feel the pain here, maybe an eight minute trip, whereas it really was more like a 13 minute trip if we counted all of the thousands of people being slowed down by a second or two or something behind me. And so, um, you know, economists will talk about, well, wouldn't it be great if we could charge for that? Uh, but it's it's very hard. You need um, a lot of technology on the vehicle, and and that's coming with these these smarter vehicles. But it, we don't have it yet. So people look at these these simpler things, um, BMT fees. So at least there's stability. You kind of know. I would recommend five cents per mile as a VMT fee to go maybe to the DOTs, but for other reasons maybe education, healthcare, emissions, uh, you know, incentivizing electric vehicles or something, you could go to 10 cents per VMT. Um, and that helps reflect, you know, a lot of things. There's also crash externalities. I know you pay for insurance, but, and I know you bear a lot of the cost of a crash if you're in one because of the, all the hassle that accrues to you and your family. Um, but a lot of the costs are imposed by others, especially if you cause the crash. Um, and crashes also cause congestion uh, if there's anybody else out there in the vicinity. Uh, so odometer readings, this kind of thing, you can have GPS data loggers. Um, if you keep the dongle in the vehicle, um, that is though, you know, something that has to be enforced, which is tricky. And as these, these are much more expensive to collect than gas taxes, you know, so 200 refineries, I said earlier, versus, you know, hundreds of millions of individual vehicles. Um, so California had a road charge pilot where it tried different technologies back in 2016, which was kind of nice. So uh, different people um, signed up if they had a preference for a different technology. And, and so they got some good information there. And then Oregon and earlier um, had about 5,000 volunteers and, and they were making actual payments, but they, they didn't have to pay the gas tax at that point. So they were um, resolving their bill every time they went to a gas station. Of course, if you were an electric vehicle, you'd have to resolve your bill somewhere else because guess what guys, we do not go to the gas station with that Tesla. And we rarely go to the gas station with the Prius, which is fantastic. 
So zone-based pricing is something they use when the congestion is heavy, like in London or Singapore and Milan, Stockholm, Gothenburg, and now, of course, Manhattan. I'm not sure what the, 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 the line is. It might be like 110th Street or something. Um, but these charges are pretty simple. So I'm not a huge fan of them because you can get into the area and drive around all day and pollute and um, cause noise and maybe some crashes <laughs> that you didn't even notice because the people behind you crashed uh, from something you did. Uh, but really the issue is congestion. That's why we have these, these kinds of these. Um, and so Singapore is, has always been in the, in the lead. Um, and so this is London, I guess, but Singapore is now moving to cellular. Uh, and so that GPA is, GPS positioning allows them to know actually lane by lane. So you could start charging lane by lane. And in the, in the drop points, the places they're a little bit nervous that they might lose cellular, they've got roadside readers as well um, that, are, that are giving them information to, to make sure they don't lose the, the trace on that vehicle. Of course, Singapore has a very small fleet, costs $100,000 to just get a vehicle and be allowed to use it for, I think, six years in Singapore. Um, Shanghai, also very expensive now. And uh, I think as you probably know, Beijing now has a lottery system, but unfortunately they introduced that lottery system to get one of these polluting, loud, congesting things. Awesome, awesome device. I use a vehicle almost every day, um, you know, motorized vehicle almost every day, but um, they, they, they instituted those policies after the cat had gotten out of the bag. And so they already had too many vehicles on their roadway. So it is gridlocked in those cities, as you probably know. Um, in any case, that's that's one way. Yeah, the, the, the policy that I like best after decades of studying this um, is, is credit-based congestion pricing. So it does take new technologies though. So I'm constantly looking for the, the least expensive way to do that variable pricing, make sure everybody has access to the asset. And if they don't want to use that credit, which might be 20 to $50 a month, depending on what region you live in, they can spend it on other ways to get around locally. They can't take it to Europe and pretend that they're in the region. They have to use it um, on a mode of transportation locally. Otherwise, they just forfeit it or they can donate it maybe to a, a, a family that has a lot of travel needs and is of low income. Uh, this is a picture, by the way, of that electronic road pricing. This is a really ugly, big gantry um, using RFID tags, uh, which we have here in Texas, very ugly, very expensive to build that. So we really need to shift to kind of like a dongle base for the existing fleet and then an embedded uh, system on the new vehicles to be able to price. I don't think this means that you need to share all your whereabouts with the authorities. Um, the vehicle needs to keep track of the payment and we need to be able to audit randomly. Um, as you know, um, we do have already several corridors, maybe like 30. We have one just a couple miles away from me. I never use it because the prices go way too high. You know, it's not the way Singapore is done where it's a, a citizen-based com um, committee that's, that's creating uh, fair prices on their roadways. It's just, um, you know, that what, what the market will bear is basically how these DOTs or RMAs, um, regional mobility authorities price these, these corridors. And they give the user no information on how much time she would save by getting into that told lane. So it's really uh, suboptimal how it's being managed in this country. Um, but we do have corridors like that right now. And they're almost all transponder um, or radio frequency, a simple 25 cent sticker based um, and of course, buses ride free. I definitely do not recommend that other high occupancy vehicles like me and my family ride free. We're already splitting the cost across a bunch of us. And, and um, that incentive really doesn't incentivize hardly any travelers to, to carpool. Uh, it takes a very high fee and a very special situation for the carpools to come together. So we really need some demonstrations of this. I'd love to see all of you technologists um, you know, I'd love to speak with you about getting that price down. I think it's about 90 bucks for the dongle right now. You can buy one for your kid to keep track of where she is. Um, and then a $5 per month kind of fee uh, on that. And so uh, the cellular based approach is the way Singapore is going now. And they spent a fair amount of money on it. Um, so there's different ways to do it. 
uh, different advantages and limitations, I'll go ahead and put a URL into the chat box for you um, if I have access to all. I, I'm not sure. I think I'm in a small Zoom room here. So the live stream, hopefully that will get up there um, a URL for this paper. But you can just Google my last name and go into my website and look for uh, some of these papers on the technology as, as well as the uh, methodology of anticipating what the impacts would be of each of these different kinds of, of fees. Um, auditing process is going to be really important. Uh, so generally, I would say a random audit and to, where you have photographs of where the vehicles are to kind of um, say, does your tally include this particular instance and to make sure that the vehicle is fully reporting. Um, and, and of course, there are ways that some people, some you know, high technology people might try to avoid this, but I think they'll eventually be caught because of the camera system. We're allowed to, to take um, pictures of your vehicle. And so as long as the system is tied to the vehicle, um, we, can, we can catch it rather than carrying it around on your cell phone. Um, and so, yeah, there's, Bruce, do you have a question? Nope. nope, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, there's phased hardware mi migration we talk about in that paper that I'll be posting. Um, there's some more details maybe about the Oregon um, approach. And, and so um, UC researchers found that $100 <laughs> annual EV fee reduced, unfortunately, that, that purchase decision. Um, by about 11% and, and plugins by about 18%. So we really can't afford as a species um, to inhibit that shift. I know that EVs are not energy free. They are not emissions free over their lifetime. They're about half the carbon cost and um, probably lower on other emissions than your internal combustion engine. So they still carry a cost. Uh, so my recommendation is an e-bike <laughs> for your shorter trips. Um, there's different options that Orgo used. Um, and then uh, there's also the idea of, of pricing carbon directly. Um, there's different grids though across our, our country, as you know, famously as the Texas grid shut down in February um, because of climate change. So we lost the jet stream, which we've long known is a real issue with climate change or the climate crisis or the climate emergency. And so that polar vortex was able to get to us again. And it, we're gonna see it back again and again. And we haven't, we don't have, um, you know, some of the, the um, checks on, on cold in, in place that we need here now in Texas because we've really harmed the jet stream. Uh, so I, I think I've exceeded my time probably, but I really appreciate your attention. Um, this is that website, just Google that crazy last name of mine. And so we've got, you know, like at least 20 congestion pricing papers, another 20 on electric vehicles. And, and feel free, of course, to reach out to me directly. I'm still in that on other conferences week, but my time will free up a, a fair bit next week. Um, so I think we have 10 minutes for questions and answers. Is that right, Bruce? We do, we do. Super. Thank you very much, Kara. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, one of the one of our uh, respondents was uh, struck by your uh, the your point about the, uh, the the loss of the money from taxes, and uh, he says uh, it's it's not much an effect now at VVs at two percent. But if the EVs were at much higher percentage, then then it would it would bite a more it would bite more. Absolutely, I okay. agree. Yeah, and and so this is pro and which is why you went through the other options of how to deal with this, right? Yeah. Um, and I but I wanted to bring that up because it was you know it's one of the things that that we you know, that we, that we worry about <laughs> when we start talking about transitions, right? Yeah, um, but I mean, I really feel that the big thing we should be wor worried about and the big thing we should be marching on the Capitol, in addition to voting rights and everything else, but is these gas taxes are way too low. And I think I get interviewed about this all the time, you guys, because we have higher gas uh, prices in August and, and late summer. And of course, with the vaccinations that I hope all of you have done uh, mm. for COVID, you know, we're seeing more people leaving in their vehicles. Um, and, and so the price always goes up and we're so aware of the gas price. And we think it's such a big deal because when we go anywhere, we see these 
ugly little signs telling us it's 240 here, it's 320 here. And believe me, the price of an orange varies way more than the price of gasoline in this country, but they don't show the price of oranges on these signs as you'd move around the, the, your, your city. So people are way too um, you know, obsessed with this silly little price that they barely spend any money on, uh, quite honestly. Um, so you know, about a dollar a day um, or less per, per vehicle. Does that include insurance? <laughs> oh no, to a vehicle. Oh my gosh. It's like $15 I wish, a day. I wish, right? <laughs> oh yeah. $15 a day. I think um, for most vehicles, some of you own vehicles that are $25 a day just to own. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not to use. Yeah. Uh, Kara, when you were talking about uh, putting a, the charge the, of the gas tax on the refineries rather than at the tank, uh, how does that, how does that play out? Well, the refineries, you know, produce a bunch of gasoline and they eventually sell it. And so they just pay based on their volumes. And so they pass that along um, uh, pretty much 100 percent. They have no problem passing that one along. Uh, some taxes, it's harder to pass along, uh, as you can imagine. And so it depends on the elasticity of demand. Um, but yeah, there is a little bit of a response to a 40 cent per gallon average gas tax in this country. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you know, is yeah, I I always think about the gas tax as being added to the to the price at the pump, so that you know it, it all, it's always there. Uh, when you do it at the refinery, it's is it very much the same thing? It's just they're going to pass it on in in, in different pricing in their pricing structure. Yeah, just like an airline has airport fees that they're tacking on. And I mean, they can be really significant at the airport. I mean, half of your, your fee for that ticket can be, um, and more than half of some of you have noticed recently, um, because during COVID, demand was so depressed for that industry. Okay. Uh, one question has says, what sorts of policy plans have been implied to make the EV transition a fair technology movement for less advantaged drivers in terms of access to refueling, rural urban, income hierarchy, et cetera? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, I really feel a lot of lower income people are in the used market and I bet the other speakers will back me up on that. So um, I, I don't know that, that there is much going on um, in terms of vehicle, you know, but we do have, a lot of things that help. I think gasoline can actually be purchased with food stamps, um, from what I understand. So correct me if I'm wrong, folks, but um, you know it's a very basic thing. Uh, it, access and mobility are, are so fundamental to getting to work and to healthcare and to education. Um, and that is why we um, fund, like we subsidize transit at the tune of $1.50 per passenger mile in this country. Uh, the fare box only collects about 25 cents per passenger mile. And um, some people you know, ride for free. And um, we feel that mobility is so important. We spend a ton per passenger mile. We could just put them into Lyft line and Uber pool vehicles and probably spend about that much. Um, so it is incredibly important. We do subsidize travel in many ways and probably very suboptimal ways. I'd like to see a, a much more demand responsive transit system with much more nimble vehicles and get rid of the diesel, of course. Is that where the uh, um, kind of like the short trips to uh, move people from mass transit to their to their homes to their to where they want to go is that where you're talking about uh, of optimizing it you mean first mile last mile to uh, get yeah. to a, a well for train stations yeah but um on a lot of trips uh, you can see there's hardly anybody on these buses and they're very large and this is pre-covid too um and, and so it's it's just that driver is so expensive, and so they put a very a lot of seats behind that that driver, and um, and of course bus demand goes up and down all day long. But you can turn off small vehicles and leave them um, until you need them for the different peaks. Uh, you don't have that eight hour bus driver uh, requirements uh, on the labor. Uh, contracts and things like that. So I, I think it's uh, mostly for entire mile trip, um, but where those big assets exist, like those train stations, those are very expensive assets and in highly congested corridors, you yes, you're gonna wanna merge, but really those big vehicles aren't that much more efficient than a bunch of small vehicles, which are um, on much higher frequency and much closer to door to door. 
Do you still have to pay the drivers? Oh, yes. Right now, you definitely still have to pay the drivers. Pay the drivers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, but what I would love to see do is if we could trust one another, right, um, to, to open our doors and our seats and um, just, you know, if you guys get the Uber, what's it called? The Waze Carpool app, you can yeah. tell people, you know, I'm a, leaving approximately here to, to here at approximately this time of day. Does anybody want to go with me? And they can pay you 50 cents a mile and avoid the whole tax implications of, of paying people more for their labor. And, and you can get people together and fill those seats now. But it is um, a chicken or an egg. You do need that critical mass of drivers and passengers posting. So we only really see that kind of sh casual sharing on longer distance trips. Right. And you need it and you need trust. Right, right. So, you yeah. know, a lot of women are scared. Um, I love <laughs> Uber Pool and Lyft Line. Uh, Lyft often just puts me with other women, which is interesting yeah. to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, one uh, uh, attendee said that. Uh, HOV lanes <clears throat> uh, that incent, uh, were incentives for EVs uh, seem to have been a big motivator in California. Uh, yes. Do you think this was uh, helpful in this case? Because you, yeah. you were kind of talking against the HOV lanes, right? Oh, well, in terms of enforcing the high occupancy, but it's not too hard to label a vehicle an EV. The issue is trying to see through those darn tinted windows and count whether that's a live human body in the back seat. Okay. Even in the front seat now, there's very little light intrusion into the cabins of our vehicle. So even the police have really, it's very difficult to see through. And at high speed, it's a total waste of money to try to enforce that. Okay. All right. Uh, how do you see the changes uh, in the EV tax? What, could they disrupt EV adoption in the early stage, considering the low market share at the moment? Oh, yeah, especially when they're high. So, I mean, yeah. some places you're know, like $200, you know, they don't even do the math of what they're paying for gas in their own vehicle. They don't even understand how low the gas taxes are. Um, so it's, 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 it's sad. Um, but, and then of course, I know a lot of BEV owners don't drive that vehicle 10,000 miles a year, which is the average use of a household vehicle in this country. Um, you know, a lot of EV owners are just thoughtful about the environment. So they're traveling 5,000, maybe 3,000 miles a year. And so it's, it, it, you know, it does change that calculus. List. But again, sixty dollars versus one hundred dollars versus thirty dollars. I, I don't see how that matters. Uh, the problem is, you know, you pay it all at once, and so that you know yeah. may be a sticker shot for some people. Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. It, it, when I when we talk about the transition to EVs, uh, I always talk about, think about it as how do I make everything as simple and as easy as possible so that someone can make this transition, so that a buyer doesn't have to pay more for a vehicle. That that the uh, licensing is the same. The the uh, the you know the but their but their their fill up charge is less uh, because you're just plugging in. How how do I make it easy for them? And this is where that gas tax story came in, right? Yeah, but you just gave me this idea that um, it doesn't all have to happen at the start. So California was leasing at sub-market rates, BEVs, to get people used to them, which was really smart. So, and then, you know, a lot of people ended their lease and bought one of a slightly different make or model or something. And, um, and, and so that was, that was California, but that was a nice way. So you kind of get the benefit up front and then maybe you pay a little more over time or something. You could imagine a higher reg fee if we give you a lower purchase. And mm -hmm. um, I do think the fee bait is a really nice strategy too here. So we have like a, a target fuel economy for every MPG you're above it. Um, and just for example, the Prius is about 50 MPG and like a Tesla might be 125 MPG. Um, but, you know, it'd probably be an inverse relationship, but for MPGs above it, you're paying less and less because those who have lower fuel economy, the gas guzzlers are paying uh, basically to get that right. And um, so fee baits a revenue neutral kind of strategy that would also really help with that upfront um, sticker shock that we're still seeing for EV buyers. Yeah, very good. Well, Kara, I think you've done your duty. Uh, you, you, you are now uh, released uh, to uh, continue on with uh, the next talk. Thanking everyone for attending and also uh, uh, promoting our next conference, our 
uh, future of automotive IT and autonomous vehicle update. Maybe we'll have Kara talk about her autonomous vehicle work. Uh, this is on September 1st. Um, also, as usual, we wanna thank our affiliates for, for uh, so, uh, sponsoring and supporting our, our, our conferences. Um, the conference review is, uh, is gonna be available. The conference uh, uh, presentations will be online this weekend. Um, the uh, meet the speaker story as I talked to you about. And, uh, and I think that's it uh, until tomorrow where we have uh, day two of the powertrain strategies for the 21st century conference, um, where we'll be uh, hearing from um, uh, Corning uh, uh, as well as Bosch and Denso and the results from our recent powertrain strategies for 21st century survey. So thanks everybody and we'll see you tomorrow.